Yes, so uh, I'm uh, going to be telling you today about um, uh, the, the aspect of physics that I work on, which is the acquisition side. And I guess the, the first question, um, if I could briefly get a survey, how many people here are, are already working with MR data? Good, okay, I kind of assumed that, so that's, that's great. So I'm, I'm gonna mostly assume that you, you don't really know much of anything about diffusion, but I kind of assumed that, that you do know a bit about uh, MRI, and so I'm gonna skip over some of the, the more basic aspects of that. Um, so, uh, if I can find, okay, I've got all sorts of gadgets here. So, there we go. All right, so we'll start off with what is diffusion. Um, and as I'm sure most people here know, diffusion is just the random motion of particles due to thermal energy. Um, so water molecules in a, in a glass of water are constantly colliding with each other because they have heat. Um, and that causes a net displacement. And you can see this effect. You can't see it very easily in water itself, but you can see this effect at home if you take uh, a beaker of water and you drop some ink into it. And you'll, you'll see a pattern that looks like this. I'm sure we've all done this. These sort of chaotic streams of the ink as it's moving um, and distributing itself throughout that, that glass of water. That is the process of diffusion. Um, and it, it's happening all the time, we just don't normally see it. So diffusion then is this displacement of water molecules. And remember in MRI we're always looking at water molecules, water molecules are everywhere and they're a fantastic probe of the tissue environment that they find themselves in. And this displacement, um, where uh, if, we, if we think of this, this ink um, uh, concept where you, you, you start off with um, ink, it's all in one location, and then it redistributes itself over space. This is kind of how we actually think of what's happening to water molecules. If you imagine if you, if you were to instantaneously tag a bunch of water molecules and then watch to see where they um, displace to over time, then what you would see is something very similar to that droplet of ink. It would displace over time, um, and that displacement, the, 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 um, uh, the expected displacement of water molecules is described by a Gaussian. So here we just have a, um, a simple Gaussian that has some width that is uh, described by, by two factors. The first is the diffusion coefficient. That's just a property of the material. So water would have a relatively high diffusion coefficient and a viscous fluid would have a much lower diffusion coefficient. Um, and then the other factor is time. How long do you allow those water molecules to move? And it's a very simple relationship. So this is a relationship um, known as, as sort of Brownian motion that Einstein um, came up with this relation for. Um, and normally, this process um, in just a glass of water is isotropic. So that means that it's equal in all directions. Okay. So the reason why diffusion is interesting to us then is because the presence of tissue boundaries modifies this diffusion process. So in an unrestricted environment, like a glass of water, water molecules will diffuse equally in all directions, um, and they will move according to that diffusion coefficient I just described. But if we um, are in the, uh, if we were looking at water molecules that are in tissue where we have restricting boundaries, um, then we have the situation that the water molecules can't quite displace as freely as they would otherwise. They're, they're restricted in the way that they can move. And that then makes these water molecules a very potent marker for tissue microstructure because they're probing all aspects of that tissue microstructure. They're everywhere in the tissue. And they're very, very sensitive to their, their freedom of, of movement as uh, restricted by these small spaces. So this creates a, a marker that can be used for healthy tissue and for pathological tissue, and we'll hear all about that today. So one of the things that's, that's most interesting to me, and I think probably to most people here, is specifically what happens to diffusion in white matter. And we tend to be a bit organ-centric in the diffusion MRI community. There are lots of people out there who are doing diffusion in outside of the brain. Um, I'm not one of them, <laughs> at least not anymore. Um, but uh, th there, is, there is one sort of good reason for that, I think. I think it's, you know, sometimes we, we're, we're a bit too um, myopic in terms of our focus on the brain. There's lots of other interesting places to do diffusion. But one of the reasons why it is so interesting to do diffusion in the brain is because of this effect, diffusion anisotropy. And white matter is, is the, the one tissue where we see this very, very strongly in the, in the body. Um, so the basic idea is that um, if you have a, an axon, um, where we have the cell body here and then this long process um, that is carrying information off to another part of the brain, so that this is the axon. Um, water is free to diffuse along the axon. It's not faster than usual, but it's 
basically free diffusion as if there were no restricting barriers. But across that axon, water molecules are very restricted in how far they can diffuse. And this then leads to the property of anisotropy. There's a preferred direction of diffusion. Um, and th that putting it that way, it almost makes it sound like water is, is, is being amplified in its diffusion along the axons. That's not what's happening. What's happening is that it's being restricted perpendicular to the axons. So this then creates um, a very interesting effect uh, that is able to detect the directionality of these axons. So if we were to look at water molecules inside an axon, and here I'm just representing them by cylinders, um, the, the water molecules um, would be moving relatively freely along the axon, but restricted across it. And this directionality of that diffusion process then tells us something about the fiber integrity or structure and, inc importantly, the orientation of those axons. So let's start with the diffusion tensor, although it's, it is a somewhat, um, uh, I think, well, much maligned <laughs> measure. Um, in particular, already several, um, uh, uh, several times it's come up that this is maybe not the best model for diffusion. It's still quite a powerful one, and it's one that does have a number of situations where it's a very appropriate measure to use. So what is the diffusion tensor? The diffusion tensor says, okay, well, let's take this, this property of water molecules being preferential in their diffusion and the direction of diffusion, and let's just approximate that as an ellipsoid. In other words, if instead of seeing water molecules moving out e equally in all directions, forming a sort of a, a spherical pattern of diffusion, we'll represent it as an ellipsoid. So it has some, some orientation to it, but it, it's sort of the simplest oriented um, extension of the concept of a sphere. So we basically just fit an ellipsoid to this process. And that ellipsoid then has um, various parameters that are useful to extract. Um, and those, these will of often be referred to as the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. If you're not used to eigenvector analysis, all it means is the eigenvectors are, represent the directions of diffusion. So one axis, one eigenvector will represent the primary axis of diffusion, and then the other two will represent perpendicular to that. And the eigenvalues will just represent how strong the diffusion is. So along that primary direction, you expect to have a, s a higher eigenvalue than perpendicular directions. So from this, then, we can start to extract useful quantities that encapsulate the aspect of, of diffusion that, that we're most, most interested in. Um, and there, there are a number of, of things that we can extract from this tensor. The first is just the apparent diffusion coefficient. And now this is one of the first places where you'll, you'll, you'll start to see that the people in the diffusion community are often, they're pretty anal about the w how, they, how they term things. We're not going to call it the diffusion coefficient. It's the apparent diffusion coefficient. And there is a good reason for that. Because we know what the diffusion coefficient is. It's d in water. It has a very specific value, and that is not what we measure. What we measure is something different. And we'll get into a bit later why it is that we measure something different. But it has to do with all of these restricting, um, the, the restrictive properties of tissue. So the apparent diffusion coefficient, then, um, is a useful measure that we can come up with that's just taking the mean diffusion coefficient across all directions. And this tells us about tissue integrity. Okay. And I'll come back to these questions of what do I mean by integrity a bit later. It's kind of a catch-all term that we use to mean how restrictive is the environment that the water molecules find themselves in because, in general, restriction corresponds to intact structure at the microstructural level. Okay. Fractional anisotropy. So this is one of the most commonly used measurements um, that's extracted from the tensor. And it just says how elongated is this ellipsoid. So roughly, how much stronger is the tendency to diffuse along that principal direction compared to the other directions. And this tells us about fiber integrity. Again, the word integrity, I'll come back to that. Finally, the principal diffusion direction. So this is the direction along which diffusion is greatest. And that then, in general, will correspond to the direction of these axons, so the direction that the connections are running in the brain. So this tells us about fiber orientation. So in its most general form, then, the, the most sort of vanilla thing that one might do when one has some diffusion data uh, would be within each imaging voxel, you fit this tensor model. You fit an ellipsoid. And then you extract in each voxel the corresponding properties of interest. So for example, you can create 
images of apparent diffusion coefficient or images of fractional anisotropy or principal diffusion direction. And I'll come back to these uh, each, each independently in a moment. But basically, this is, this is the first port of call that we had as a community in trying to use this data to tell us something interesting about tissue. So just briefly talking about what these, these parameters actually tell us. So apparent diffusion coefficient, this is one that I, am not, I do not have a, a, a lot of expertise in um, because it much more um, relates to the clinical realm. Um, but there is a, 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 an important use of diffusion imaging, which I really won't talk about, in the, use of, uh, in, in the area of, of, of diagnosing stroke. So um, between acute stroke and chronic stroke, you have serious changes to the diffusion coefficients with a, a fairly um, interesting sort of time course. So in acute stroke, you have a reduction in diffusion coefficient. In chronic stroke, you have an increase. And exactly what the underlying um, biophysical mechanisms of this are, they're not, they're not as um, obvious as people initially thought. Um, so this is actually probably the, the, the biggest use of diffusion imaging um, worldwide, but this is not what I'm going to be focusing on or the rest of us are going to be focusing on. We're going to be talking much more about the use of diffusion to extract this information about um, about connections in the brain, about the direction that the white matter fibers are running. And here, uh, this is where, again, the first protocol would be looking at the fractional anisotropy. So this is just how elongated um, the diffusion process is in a given voxel. So for example, a fractional anisotropy value of zero would be an isotropic diffusion um, profile. So for example, if you look um, in the brain, if you were to look in the ventricles, you would see um, a process that's that uh, you would see that the, the fractional anisotropy is roughly zero. The, the diffusion is basically isotropic. If you, on the other hand, were to look in a major white matter tract, so here, for example, this is the corpus callosum that's attaching the two hemispheres, and if you were to look in a voxel right about here, what you would see is an ellipsoid that's elongated like this, and that would have high fractional anisotropy. So the maximum value that fractional anisotropy can obtain is one, unless you have some serious programming mistakes. Um, <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so th theoretically, the maximum the maximum value is one, um, and the, the 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 larger that value is, then the more elongated um, the ellipse is. So here you would you would expect to see quite high anisotropy, and then this is what these images look like. So if you're used to looking at images of the brain, you basically see a map of the white matter, but you very specifically see it's not just a flat map of white matter like you might expect to see in a structural image. You see heterogeneity across different white matter tracts, and that relates to how. Um, it, it relates in, in part to how heterogeneous is the fiber structure in those different white matter tracts. And so, for example, in the corpus callosum, it's a very simple tract structure. It is basically everything is running all in one direction. And so what you see is a very strongly anisotropic diffusion um, compared to some other uh, uh, white matter tracts where you may even see quite low fractional anisotropy because of the presence of more complicated structure, which we'll get into later. Um, so the, the, the last, I guess, property we might um, talk about extracting from the tensor uh, would be the principal diffusion direction. So um, there's a number of ways of trying to visualize this, but this is basically, again, it's it, in every voxel, it's a vector indicating what direction the fibers are running. Um, and there's various ways you can try and display this. So these are the two most common. Here, simply showing on top of a fractional anisotropy map, showing what the vector is in each, in each voxel. It's a little bit difficult to, um, uh, to look at this because you really do have to, be quite, um, you have to be quite zoomed in in order to really appreciate what the structure is. Um, so another way that people often like to look at this is shown here, which is using a color map. So each direction is encoded with a color. So um, right, left is encoded in red. Anterior posterior is encoded in green and uh, through plane, so superior inferior is, in is in blue. Um, it takes a while to get used to looking at these images. The first time you look at them, it's a bit difficult to make much sense of it. But once once you um, once you've kind of adapted to this, um, you can actually see a lot of information in, in in this way of looking at things. So this then leads us to diffusion tractography, which is where I think things start to to get really interesting. So it's nice to look at the direction that that the fibers are running in any given voxel but it doesn't really tell you much on its own. What you really need to, to do, um, or what, you really wa we, what we usually want to do, is to use that information to, ex to extract the, the tract structure, to actually segment out how is the information getting from point A to point B. And this is what diffusion tractography aims to do, and this is, th I think, probably the thing that is most um, appealing to most people in neuroscience, because there really is not any other way to get at this kind of information 
without doing something quite invasive. So this is the only non-invasive in vivo technique that you can use for doing this. And basically, the idea is quite simple. Um, you just connect the dots, and you trace a path from one region to another. Okay? Now, obviously, um, saying you just connect the dots is, is an oversimplification. This is actually a very tricky process um, to do sort of rigorously and carefully. But conceptually, that's exactly what we do. And you can use that then to create some of these um, very beautiful uh, wiring diagrams of, um, uh, of the major pathways in the brain. Um, and so this is uh, one of the, the sort of um, uh, most commonly demonstrated um, major white matter pathways that you can reconstruct using this technique. So that's what we're talking about. That's what we want to do. What I haven't told you anything about is what I'm actually supposed to be talking about yet, which is, which is how we actually acquire this data. So. Um, these are the main topics that I'm going to be going through. Um, how, is, how do we achieve diffusion weighting? How do we acquire the image? What are limitations, trade-offs, complications? And then a little bit at the end on what we, what we can do with this data. And in particular there, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, one of my sort of pet topics at the moment, which is um, trying to move beyond some of these, in particular moving beyond measures that are extracted from um, uh, a tensor-based analysis. So um, how do we acquire the data? Uh, just remind you of a few very important points um, that are basic MRI physics before we jump into diffusion, uh, more diffusion specific um, things. So the first is precession, right? So the magnetization that we're dealing with when we um, tip it away from alignment with the main magnetic field, it precesses. So it undergoes this sort of funny rotation about the axis of the, of the magnetic field. So V0 is along this direction and the magnetization is going to sort of rotate like a top about that, that orientation. And this is important because this is the only way that we can actually detect signal is when it's tipped away from alignment with the main magnetic field. And there's a very specific rate at which the magnetization precesses, given by this omega naught. And for our purposes, there's sort of two components to that. The first is the strength of the main magnetic field, B0, so a three Tesla scanner, a 1.5 Tesla scanner, seven Tesla, whatever. Um, and then the second component is any offset. So in other words, if there's an additional magnetic field that's modulating that main magnetic field, that will then alter this rate of precession. And importantly, for our purposes, one of the main ways that we, we alter that magnetic field is using what are called gradients. So these are the magnetic field gradients. They're just magnetic fields that are sort of linear over space and which we can alter. So we can turn them on and off, we can uh, mod modulate their amplitude, etc. And we have three of these along X, Y, and Z. This is what we use to encode an image, but here we're going to use them for a different purpose. The second effect that that's, uh, I just wanted to briefly remind you of um, is uh, what's referred to as a spin echo. So the, um, what I'm showing you here is an animation of a, um, an M MRI acquisition protocol where we ha use two radio frequency pulses. The first one tips the magnetization into the XY plane, as we saw previously. And each magneti magnetization component then is going to un undergo this processional rotation motion. Okay? And what I'm actually showing you here is a range of magnetization vectors each with a slightly different magnetic field, so each is rotating in a slightly different processional rate. So the first RF pulse tips them into plane, and because they each have a slightly different frequency, they fan out relative to each other, so each simply rotates at its processional rate. The trick then is that we play this second pulse, which I is a, a radio frequency pulse that instead of rotating the magnetization into the transverse plane, into the XY plane, it flips it within that plane, so it rotates it by 180 degrees. And what that does is to exactly reverse the effects of the precession in that first period. So however far the magnetization has rotated about in the first half of the experiment, this 180 degree pulse puts it in exactly the right location such that when it carries on processing, it comes back to where it started from. And that happens independent of what frequency the magnetization is actually rotating at. So every single component of the magnetization will come back into alignment at this point here. If we then look at the signal that we acquire, all of these different magnetization components would be within one MRI voxel. So the signal that we get in that MRI voxel is the summation across all of these different components. So when they're fanned out relative to each other, they partially cancel. 
But as long as we bring them back into alignment, then we will bring some of that signal back. And we see this peak in signal here, which is referred to as an echo. So this is a spin echo, and it's the basis of, the seek of, of pretty much all diffusion imaging experiments. What we do with the spin echo to turn it into a diffusion weighted image is to introduce some additional gradients, which I've showed here. So these two um, uh, peaks here, these are showing you what the radio frequency pulses are doing. Okay, that's what um, moves the magnetization in a three-dimensional space. These two trapezoids are indicating gradients. So it's indicating that we, we turn on one of these linear chain variations in the main magnetic field and we leave it on. Usually we use those gradient fields to encode the image itself, to form voxels and to, to, to specify what the field of view is. In this case, they're going to create sensitivity to diffusion. And so we're going to refer to them as diffusion gradients. So how does this work? Um, so this is the same um, uh, acquisition sequence that I was just showing you. Um, and what I'm depicting underneath here is a, a, a voxel, okay, an imaging voxel with a bunch of uh, water molecules in it, each indicated by a little arrow. And in the background, the color is indicating this magnetic field gradient. So we have high field at this end of the voxel and low field at this end of the voxel. So what I'm gonna show you now is a movie illustrating what happens to these magnetization components after we excite them using this RF pulse. And they are experiencing these, um, these, these gradients uh, here and here, okay? So when we excite the magnetization into the transverse plane, it starts to process according to its local field. So you can see vertically, they've all gone to the same position. We flip them 180 degrees, and as they carry on processing in the same magnetic field, they move back into alignment with each other. So this is exactly the same effect that I was showing you in the spin echo animation where they're fanning out. I'm just now showing exactly where each of those spins is within a voxel. So this is in the absence of any diffusion. These spins are not moving and the magnetization all comes back into alignment and we get a nice high peak in the signal. If we look at the case where the water molecules are diffusing, now what we see is that they no longer have this simple relationship where they're, they're moving at a constant rate because they're, they're moving around in the voxel. So they're experiencing a variable magnetic field. And that means that over time, they start to accrue a somewhat random um, uh, Phase. I'm not sure if I can actually go back on this and play that again, just so you can see it again. Okay. Right. So you can see that in initially they're, they're, they're somewhat organized, but as the, the, uh, the molecules are moving around, they become quite jumbled up in the main magnetic field. And so even after we flip them and allow them to sort of c carry on for the same period as, as before, you can see that they're, they, they have a tendency to all point in the same direction, but that they are still very um, uh, distributed in terms of, of the direction that they're pointing. And so, again, they're going to partially cancel each other, and we're going to have signal loss. So we now have lower signal than we would have otherwise. So the, the, the signal that we're, we're acquiring them when we use these gradients um, is one where the amount of diffusion is ultimately encoded in the signal level, the signal amplitude. So if the magnetization is completely stationary, we would have a high signal. With moderate diffusion, we would have some drop in signal, and with very rapid diffusion, we would have an even more um, uh, extreme loss of signal. So the faster the diffusion, the less signal. It's quite a simple um, relationship. And in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship that's very easy to quantify. Um, if we are looking here uh, at the signal. Um, this is the signal that we, we achieve. The, the signal um, depends on the diffusion coefficient, so how quickly the, the magnetization is moving. That's the thing that we're trying to get at. Um, this uh, value here, called the B value, which I'll get to in a moment, and then just exactly how much signal we would have had if we hadn't used those diffusion encoding gradients. This just gives us a, a baseline value. So we have a signal loss mechanism and we have this B value, which determines how much signal we lose due to diffusion. And provided we know what the B value is, then we can actually invert this and get out the diffusion coefficient itself. So the signal sensitivity is given by the B value. So what is the B value? Um, it's based on these gradients themselves. So the B value is affected by the gradient strength. So is, do we have a very shallow or do we have a very um, sharp gradient field or do we have a shallow gradient field? 
as well as the gradient duration. How long do we leave that magnetic field on? And you can kind of get some intuition for that. So you can, you can imagine, you can see that, um, that as you turn this gradient strength up, for a shallow gradient, magnetization has to move quite a distance in order for it to experience a change in that magnetic field. Whereas for a sharp gradient, it doesn't have to go very far in order for that change in um, its position to translate into a pretty serious change in its, its rate of precession. Similarly, if we, uh, if we allow ma the magnetization to move within these magnetic fields for longer periods of time, again, they're going to displace further. So even for a shallow magnetic uh, field gradient, they could still experience a fairly large change in their underlying rate of precession. So these two factors then, um, it, and it's, uh, it's the product of these two, um, leads to the B value that we have in any given experiment. So provided we know what our gradients are doing, then we know exactly what the B value is. So how do we then estimate D? Well, we basically have a very simple equation with one known, which is our diffusion weighting, two unknowns, what is the unweighted signal, and what's the diffusion coefficient. So it is really quite straightforward. We have two unknowns. We need at least two measurements in order to estimate this. So if one was to want to estimate um, a single diffusion coefficient, you would need to get two images, one without any weighting, and that gives you this S0 factor, and then one with a, a large B value, which allows you to extract the diffusion coefficient. But what about orientation? So remember that the diffusion process is not the same in all directions. So I didn't mention it at the time, but when I initially showed you this, um, uh, this, this voxel with its underlying uh, gradient, that measurement was only sensitive to diffusion of water molecules along the direction of the gradient. That's the only direction along which we have, we have encoded position based on the underlying uh, rate of precession, how quickly the magnetization is rotating. If there was only diffusion along this direction, we would never see any change in the signal. So if we want to estimate diffusion along different directions, then we need multiple measurements where we change the direction that the magnetic field gradient is along. So we might get one measurement with a, a, a field um, gradient varying along this direction and another with it varying along this direction. Okay. So just to see how, how well you're all getting along with this. So um, if we have this process of diffusion, so this is showing you how water molecules are moving within a voxel, and we get two measurements. One is a measurement along this direction and one is along this direction. So this is measurement one, measurement two. Okay, so which measurement has higher signal? I have patience. <laughs> <laughs> I do this all the time in our graduate program. Anybody want to? So which, which, which one has higher signal? It will be direction one, because the water molecules are not displacing so far. So the further you go, the lower your signal. So this direction, because the water molecules are displacing along direct, along distance, along that direction, you will have more signal attenuation, so less signal, OK? Good. So um, once, you're, once you're sort of comfortable with that, then you can actually look at a given diffusion-weighted image and tell what direction the uh, diffusion direction was, uh, was along, provided you know a bit of, it, of anatomy, right? So for example, here, um, in this image, you can see that we have bright signal along the corpus callosum, so we're not waiting along that direction. Uh, you can see here also cortical spinal tract, bright signal, so we're not waiting along that direction. And here, in the, as the corpus callosum comes, um, uh, turns back toward the occipital lobe, and as these, um, uh, the, um, uh, oh my god. Brian, thank, thank you. Yeah, I would have said optic radiations, but fine. Okay, yes, that thing um, uh, is also dark. Okay, so that means that, that, that this image is weighted along this direction. Similarly, on in this middle image here, you can see that the corpus callosum is dark. The diffusion weighting is along those directions. Okay? So the faster diffusion, the less signal you have. So how many measurements do we need? Well, uh, if we want to fit a tensor, and this is important, you have to know what you want to do with the data. If you want to fit a tensor, then you have um, the unweighted signal that you still need to estimate. And then you have six other properties. You have three axes, so the three directions, and the lengths of those three axes. 
So you have seven unknowns, you need at least seven measurements. That said, um, we would never ever recommend somebody only acquires uh, seven measurements um, because it makes you extremely susceptible to noise, errors, um, any, any um, non-ideality in your data. But theoretically, you would need um, only seven measurements. So we'll say at least seven. So what we do is we acquire a series of these images, each weighted along a different direction. We also have an unweighted image, and then we combine them with some model so that we can extract properties. One thing we could do is to extract tensor-based maps. Another thing we could do would be to prepare the data in a, in a form that's suitable for diffusion tractography. We'll hear a lot more about all the things that we can do with this kind of data later. So how do we acquire the image now that we've got a, a, a signal that is weighted um, by the amount of diffusion in a given voxel? Theoretically, we, re we really could do just about anything. Okay, so once we've, once we've um, uh, played out this series of RF pulses and gradients, we can do anything we want to encode the spatial information and form an image. So we could do single line readouts like we do in structural images, and that sounds quite appealing because remember our structural images are, are you know, they're, they're very undistorted, they're of good quality, they're of high resolution. Um, we could acquire a rapid scan, um, something like an echoplanar imaging trajectory that would allow us to get the image very quickly. In practice, what we do is primarily dictated by motion, secondarily dictated by um, time constraints. So in diffusion imaging, when we use these diffusion gradients, what we're doing is we're encoding tiny, tiny displacements. So water molecules only diffuse something like 50 micrometers in the times, over the time scales that we look at. So any motion that the subject undergoes on top of that will also be encoded. So if the subject moves their head, um, if, they, uh, if you have any local pulsatility, all of that also gets encoded by these diffusion gradients. And if you try to use a, just naively use a, a, a very simple um, structural imaging single line readout, you would get an image that looks something like this. It would be completely unusable. And this is not a particularly bad subject. This is not somebody who's sitting in the, in the scanner shaking their head. Um, this is actually pretty much what you would get reliably, is an image that is absolutely unusable. Remember, we need to, we need to be able to say with some high precision, in a given voxel, what's the signal magnitude? related to the diffusion encoding that we've put on. And you could never extract that kind of information from this image. So one, one um, thought that a lot of people had early on is, well, maybe we can just avoid motion. Um, so you can put subjects into, you, know, you can restrain them quite well. The problem is um, that the brain is actually never still. So as blood flows into the brain, uh, it's a fixed casing which means that the only way to uh, accommodate that increase in volume is for something else to move out. And the thing that moves out is your brain, which is quite disturbing when you, when you think about it. But it basically displaces out through the form and magnum at the base of your skull. And the people who did the first um, measurements of, of, of this to see, to see what, what sort of velocities we're talking about um, likened this to being as if, as, as if someone was tugging on the end of your spine, which is a creepy image. Um, but it is basically what happens. So the, um, around the, in, in cortical regions, higher cortical regions, the brain is pretty still, but particularly in, in deep, um, deep uh, regions in the brain stem, the, the, the brain is actually moving up and down an awful lot. So you really, you really couldn't ever get the brain to be still on the, on the sort of spatial scale that we would need um, in order to be immune to this motion. So what we do in practice then is good old echoplanar imaging. So I'm assuming that most people here are probably somewhat familiar with this. Um, this is what we use in functional MRI. We use it here as well in diffusion imaging, but for a slightly different reason. It's the primary motivation is to get around these issues of motion. And the, the thing that is sort of serendipitous here is that the two effects that, that, um, that we, m the two types of motion that we might be interested in, one being diffusive, diffusive motion. We've already seen that what that affects is the signal magnitude. So it reduces the, 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 um, the, the strength of the signal in a given voxel. What I haven't had a, a time to go into um, is what bulk motion does. If an entire voxel shifts, you don't lose signal magnitude. What it does is it rotates the signal. So it, it basically applies a bit of a precession angle to that entire voxel, which is reflected in the signal phase. Phase is a part of the signal we typically throw away in EPI. We don't need it. And here we can do exactly that. 
if we acquire this rapid EPI acquisition, then we can simply discard the phase. It's corrupted, but we don't care, because all we care about is getting an accurate measure of the signal magnitude, and EPI will give us that. So it's, it's capable of freezing motion. Um, so that said, and there are problems with EPI, which um, I'll come back to distortion a little bit later, it has limitations on resolution, um, as well as a number of other artifacts. Um, if we could get a, a, a way with doing something that's kind of somewhere in between EPI and um, uh, a structural scan, so for example, you know, acquiring a few lines in each, in each acquisition, we would do that. And I've put a lot of time and effort into trying to make that sort of, of, a, um, of a, a, a scheme work. It's very, very hard to do. These motion artifacts are just incredibly problematic. So although there's, there's definitely been quite a bit of forward movement on getting a, a sort of a bit away from EPI over the last 10 years, um, it's certainly not the case that any of those methods are, are quite um, uh, as competitive as they, they would need to be in order to completely replace EPI. So uh, what does a typical experiment look like then? So what I'm showing you here are, um, this is a description of, of, of essentially of what we do in our center, um, where we've put quite a bit of thought into our protocols. Um, so typical uh, imaging parameters, actually, if we start here with B value. So remember, B value is the thing that tells us about our sensitivity to diffusion. So this is um, determined by the diffusion gradients that we, um, that we um, uh, run, um, put into the sequence between the excitation and the readout. Um, larger B value means more contrast, uh, but it also means lower signal, right? So there is this sort of somewhat magical number that people in the field um, ha settled on, um, which is a B value of 1,000. There is a reason why that is appealing. It's because it, it has a nice match to the, the uh, what we expect the diffusion coefficient to be. That said, people are increasingly moving toward higher and higher B values because we can. Um, so, you know, for a long time we were pretty limited because it's a low SNR technique. Because in order to create this contrast, you have to kill your signal. Um, it, it's it's a difficult thing to get to the point where you can get to increases in the B value. But with improvements in hardware, improvements in RF coils, and all of this making our measurements a lot more high SNR, um, increasingly we can move to higher B values. And Steve will talk about what we're doing in the Human Connectome Project along those lines. One of the implications of the B value um, is that it takes time. So in order to create much diffusion contrast, you have to, to, to play out this, this long series of gradients. They're much longer than we would ever um, uh, use for any imaging, for in, in other words, for creating the image itself, for, for defining voxels. It means that, um, uh, that we are limited in terms of the echo time that we can achieve. So echo time, remember, this is how long we wait until we acquire the signal. Uh, and in this case, we would like to have the echo time as short as possible because we would like to have the signal as high as we possibly can get. But we can't, and we're limited on that because we have to fit in these gradients before we can acquire the image. And so that is a big limitation. There's always a, a, a trade-off, there's always a, a tension between wanting to have a short echo time so we have high signal and wanting to have a high B value so we get lots of contrast in the image. Um, this then is just to give you a feeling for where we are in general. At three Tesla, at, um, you know, at, at this moment with a, a fairly standard clinical scanner, you could probably expect to get about a two millimeter resolution image. Um, you're limited here by the fact that we're using EPI, so our images are distorted. Um, we're also limited by SNR. So because, again, this is a technique where we're driving the signal down in order to, to make a measurement, that means that anything else you do to drive the signal down, such as going to higher resolution, is a big problem, and it's very difficult to get to the point where you can support that kind of in increase in resolution. That said, um, people are starting to push beyond this, particularly um, uh, as, as we go to higher and higher field strengths. Uh, it does seem like you know we'll be we'll be getting one millimeter data, you know, as, as a fair matter of course. I think within the next five ten years. Number of directions. So how many different orientations do you look along to 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 look at the diffusion process? Um, to be honest, I could have written any set of numbers in here. <laughs> I, just, I just chose these because it depends on what you want to do. If you want to estimate a tensor, I would say probably don't go any less than 12. On the other hand, if you have a stroke patient in the scanner, you might get three directions. 60 it was considered a few years ago to be a large number of directions to give you quite a lot of information about 
complex st structure within a voxel these days actually it doesn't sound like like so many um, so uh, yeah so s I think um, in the human connectome projects um, which okay so 90 but it at, at three different B values so um, it really is just about how long you're willing to invest in, in acquiring the data. So uh, limitations, trade-offs, and complications. So I'm just going to focus on a few of them that, um, that, that I think people most typically run into. Um, but one could go on and on about this all day. Um, but let's start with image distortion. So because we're sort of stuck to some degree with acquiring echoplanar images, it means that we um, uh, that we have to deal with this, this this issue of distortion, and it's worth just briefly trying to um, give you my view on where this distortion comes from to try and um, help you understand it a bit a bit better. So these are the same gradients that I showed you earlier when I was showed you the movie of moving back and forth in EPI, um, and the way that I think about echoplanar imaging is that we have we have these two axes, so they'll typically be referred to as the readout and the phase encode axes, but I like to think of them as just the fast and the slow axis, right? So the fast axis is the one where you're bumping back and forth very, very rapidly, and the slow axis is where you're moving from bottom to top a bit more slowly, right? So as you go back and forth, every time you, um, uh, you move up one line very slowly along this axis, and that's achieved by these, these little um, brief um, pulses of the gradients. So the way that, that I think about this then is to say, okay, well, let's, let's just simplify these gradients down. So the first thing is forget about the fact that some of these are positive and some of them are negative. Let's just, let's just look at them all in terms of their magnitude. And then let's forget about the fact that these things are varying over time. Let's just replace them with their time averaged behavior. So along the fast axis then, we have a relatively high gradient amplitude. And along the slow axis, we have a relatively low gradient amplitude. And this is, this is generally how moving around in k-space works. The, the stronger the gradient that you have, the quicker you're moving through k-space. So if we think then about the implications of this, so here we have an EPI image. Um, the slow direction is along the vertical axis, and the fast direction is along the horizontal axis, and you can just see that here. So we're moving back and forth, right to left, and then bottom to top. So along the fast axis, which is this right to left, we have a strong gradient. And that's represented here um, by this color map. So this is the expected field. We think when, um, when we are doing our imagery construction, we think, I know exactly what the magnetic field looks like, and it looks like that. And so I can then map a given, um, a, a, a given frequency, okay, a given um, uh, uh, magnetic field offset onto a very specific spatial location, or at least, at least what its location is along this horizontal axis. The problem is, that we don't have a perfectly even field. And as soon as you put somebody's head into the magnet, it distorts that magnetic field slightly. Okay? And that field error might look like this. So those of you who, are, who do fMRI will recognize that in these regions here, um, right above the sinuses, you tend to have a lot of signal dropout and heavy image distortion. Right? So these are regions where the magnetic field is, is altered. And so what we actually have when we're acquiring our image is not this field on the left. It's this field on the right. So you can think about that then in terms of a percent error. In any given spatial location, how much error is there in that magnetic field? And in this case, it's actually not too bad. You can see that the actual field looks largely like the expected field. And so along this fast direction, those errors are fairly negligible. Okay? You put the signal in pretty much the right location along that, th that direction. The situation is very different along the slow direction. So remember, the slow direction is characterized by a shallow magnetic field. It's not a very strong magnetic field gradient. So from bottom to top, we have this shallow field. We have the same field error affecting um, this as it is affecting the, the other direction. And so now when we look at the, um, the difference between the expected field that we had and the actual field, we see that we have a massive error. And what that means is that when we try to place the signal into a given spatial location, we're going to get it wrong. Because the frequency that we are detecting is not mapping to the right location. It's, it's mapping to this field map, not this field map. So this misplaced signal then translates into a distortion of the image. Where we have field errors, we misplace the signal. And you can see here, for example, this is not what a brain looks like. Um, this is, in fact, signal that's being pushed around by virtue of this, of this error in the field. 
So what can we do about this? Well, one thing that we can do about um, this is to use a, um, a technology that's really um, come about over the last 10 years, which is called parallel imaging. So parallel imaging um, takes advantage of the fact that modern receive coils, so the coil that you actually put the subject's head into, is not a single coil. It is a, a series of coils placed around the subject's head. And each of those coils only sees a small part of the brain. So this coil here only really sees the occipital lobe, and the signal drops off very rapidly toward the front. So this is, this is basically what the image would look like if you only used that, that single coil. Similarly here, a coil on the side of the head only really sees the side of the head. So what this means is that these coils have intrinsic to them some spatial information. If I get a signal that is higher in this coil than in all the other coils, it would tell me that it's close to this coil, right? So what this allows you to do then is to essentially cheat on K-space. We don't have to acquire all of the signal that we would normally think we need in order to, uh, to define an image. What we can do is just skip out on some of it and use the coils to fill in the missing data. And so this allows what's called acceleration of k-space. So I don't know how easy it is to see here, but this is, uh, uh, there, there, there's a set of, um, there's one EPI trajectory corresponding to the accelerated trajectory where lines have been skipped. And so if we think now about what's happening in an accelerated um, uh, acquisition where we skip every other line compared to an unaccelerated one. Well, now we have the same timings with respect to moving back and forth. So our readout gradient isn't changed. But now this, the gradients in order that move us from one line to the next, that jump us up in K space, they're now twice as strong to move us twice as far. And as a result, that gradient strength is stronger. So if nothing else were to change, ex what this, it, this process of, of acceleration, where we're only, m only acquiring half of the data in K-space, and we're therefore moving through data twice as, through K-space twice as, as fast, the effect is that the, um, the, the, that slow gradient strength will increase. And as a result, if we now look at our field errors, what we see is that the, the percentage error is reduced. So we will have less distortion of the images under parallel imaging. And so that's demonstrated here. So what I'm showing you here um, on the, the left and the right, these are um, images acquired um, with and without parallel imaging. So in the middle, we have parallel imaging on. On the left, we have no parallel imaging. Um, and then interestingly, what I am showing you here, th with the fact that these distortions are, um, are, are, are switching between two images in each movie, relates to um, the direction along which K-space was traversed. So what we've done is to acquire two images that are identical, except one goes bottom to top, and one goes top to bottom. And what that does is it, re it um, uh, reverses the direction of the distortion. So this is a useful thing to do for a number of reasons. I just quite like to do it because it's, it gives you a visual representation of how bad the distortions are in your images. But actually, Steve will talk a bit later about using this kind of an acquisition in order to actually remove the distortions from the images, which is a very powerful thing to be able to do. The main point here is I hope you can see that the, the distortions are reduced in the parallel imaging by quite a lot. The, so they are reduced by about a factor of two. Now that said, they are still distorted images. And you would still need to do something in order to remove that distortion if you wanted to have any um, confidence in the localization of your signal. Um, so another important trade-off that I alluded to earlier is the trade-off between echo time and B value. And so just to briefly touch on that, um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we, we, we struggle with a lot in diffusion imaging is that in order to create a, a, a reasonable B value, in order to have a signal that we can really d detect these, these signal changes due to diffusion, um, we require a fairly long um, diffusion weighting module. So all of these pulses that precede the acquisition of the image. And what that does is it creates a situation where our signal is, n we don't only lose signal due to the B value and diffusion. We're also losing signal the entire time due to T2 signal decay, okay? The, the more sort of conventional signal loss mechanism that we think of. So as we're losing signal due to T2 decay, it creates this tension between I want a high B value, so I want to have these gradients be high and long. Um, on the other hand, um, I want 
for this not to be so long that I don't have any signal left by the time I go to acquire my image. So what are the sort of things you can do about this? Um, well, if we think that we have diffusion waiting takes a very fixed amount of time, um, how could we go about then reducing uh, the echo time. And remember that in, in MRI we define the echo time as being the point at which we acquire the center of K-space, where the signal is at its, at, at its highest. So really what we want to do is to get the time of this point to be as shor short as possible after excitation, so at the, the shortest possible echo time. So one thing we can do is to use uh, a technique called partial k-space. And basically, this exploits the fact that there's redundancy of information in k-space. Um, it turns out that we don't actually need to acquire this bit here because it has the same information as this bit here. And what that allows us to do then is to trim out lines that we don't really need anyway and shift this um, the, the center of k-space to be earlier in time. And that boosts our signal. Another thing we can do would be to use parallel imaging. So just by shortening up the entire readout, we can get this time point, uh, the, or the time of, of acquisition of the center of k-space, to be earlier. Now, in both cases, it's important to realize that there's an SNR penalty associated with that. Because we're not acquiring lines of, of k-space, they are not contributing signal. Therefore, we lose some SNR. Now, as we saw the, um, for the, the partial Fourier technique, um, these were lines that don't actually contribute much signal. That's why they're black in this image. They're very low signal. So there we don't actually lose a huge amount of, of SNR associated with, with dropping these lines. And in fact, usually you'll find that you get a net gain because the, uh, the amount of signal that you've lost due to not having these lines is more than compensated for by the fact that you've, you've reduced your T2 decay. So your overall signal level is higher. It's less clear that that is a, is a gain with parallel imaging. Because in parallel imaging, you're losing lines throughout the k-space volume, even in these central high signal regions. And so you don't actually really get much out of using parallel imaging for reducing this effect. What you tend to use parallel imaging for, if you want it, is to reduce distortions. Uh, eddy currents are something um, that uh, Steve will go on a bit about um, uh, a bit more later. Um, but basically, eddy currents are um, an artifact that you m probably won't encounter in any other t kind of imaging, but are a, a, a very important issue to deal with in diffusion imaging. So anytime you have a, a, a gradient that you turn on in an MRI scanner, um, you think that you've asked for this gradient. So it's a trapezoid because it takes some amount of time for the gradient to ramp up to its full amplitude. And then you'll leave it at that amplitude for some period of time and then ramp it back down. What happens? in reality is that the, the, the attempt to change that magnetic field very rapidly is, is resisted, essentially. So in any surfaces that, have, um, that can conduct currents, you will set up a current that opposes that change in the magnetic field. And so what you get might look something more like this, where as soon as you try to change that gradient field, there's something that opposes it. And so it means that you, 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 you have a, um, a reduction in, uh, in the, the magnetic field that you're trying to achieve. These eddy currents will die out over time, but they have some um, time constants that, are, that have important implications for what we do. They don't die out very quickly. On the, on the, or, uh, sort of the, 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 the time scale of an MRI experiment, they can be quite long. They can be tens to hundreds of milliseconds. And what that means is that not only do you not quite get the gradient that you want, but actually when you think you've turned the gradient off, you still have a little bit of residual gradient hanging around. And what that does to the images um, is, is quite hideous in this case. So th uh, what I'm showing you here is a time series of fairly typical uh, diffusion data. So you can see that the diffusion direction is changing. So for example, if you look in the corpus callosum, you'll see the contrast is changing from one image to the next. But the other thing that you see is that the brain is bouncing around like mad. And obviously, this is not what is actually happening to the subject. Um, the brain cannot possibly be compressing itself over the course of this experiment. What's happening is that these eddy currents have leaked into the acquisition of the image itself. And they cause a distortion in the image. So classically, what you could try to do to get around this effect, if you, if you don't account for this effect, then you have no chance at all of coming up with a sensible estimate of the directionality of diffusion. Because from one measurement to the next, your voxels are not overlapping anymore. And you'll be comparing signal from different voxels in order to try and reconstruct, for example, a tensor. Uh, so 
classically what you would do about this would be to do something like just realign the images using um, uh, some kind of a linear registration technique. The problem with that is that these images are very low SNR and the contrast is varying from one image to the next. And that is not a very favorable situation for trying to register images together. This is a much more difficult problem, for example, than motion correction in, uh, in, in an fMRI time series. So uh, you can do a, a reasonable job of cleaning up the data until it starts to get particularly bad. And Steve will show some really amazing um, uh, uh, eddy current results when you start to use scanners that have a very, very high gradient strength. Um, but fortunately, there are methods now that people have come up with that, that, that aim to deal with this effect um, more robustly. Finally, um, I, 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 this is a, a paper that we had out a few years ago. Um, and I bring this up only because I think it highlights very nicely how one should be, one should think about the effects of artifacts in diffusion imaging. One of the, the most important things you should ask yourself um, in, in, in thinking about um, uh, a, a given change to a protocol or a given um, artifact you might have is, does this artifact look like signal? This was an artifact that did look an awful lot like signal. We had a, a signal dropout in a region of the brain and that signal dropout was related to the direction of the diffusion encoding. So whenever there was a lot of diffusion encoding along right, left, dropout. And it was, obviously this is not a, a white matter tract, um, but it looked an awful lot like the kind of structure you would expect to see in a tensor. You had low signal whenever you were waiting along right, left. And so you would see, for example, in color maps, this big red splodge, if you tried to track in the data, you would um, create tracks that are not there. And this is one of the problems of, of diffusion data, is that it's very, very sensitive to false positives. It's a different situation from what we're in with, with fMRI, where we typically worry about false negatives. Here, it's very easy for something to masquerade as, as structure and to throw you off, to give you a result that is, is not truly there. It's just that you haven't managed to account for that artifact. Okay, so um, in the last bit here, I'm going to just discuss a little bit about what we can do with the data and some of the more interesting, what I think are some of the more interesting things that are on the horizon. Um, so uh, the first um, thing to say then is to revisit this question of the diffusion tensor. Um, I've been talking a lot about the diffusion tensor partly because I think it's one of the easiest things for people to kind of, to kind of grasp. So it's very, you know, it's very uh, um, appealing in that sense. But the fact is, this is just one possible model that we might have for what's happening in diffusion um, in a voxel. And it's not always a very good model. So it's based on the assumption of Gaussian diffusion. It's based on that same assumption that we uh, started from, that water molecules will displace with an uh, according to a, um, a Gaussian that increases in variance over time. And we're just assuming that now there's just different, uh, along different orientations, that that diffusion coefficient varies. But that isn't very likely to be the case. So for example, one very easy way to break the tensor model is just to have two components of diffusion in a voxel, one of which is a, uh, an elongated ellipse, one of which is a, a sphere, so it's normal free diffusion. So for example, if you have some CSF in your voxel along with um, uh, some, some directional structure like from a white matter tract, okay? Under that, under those conditions, the tensor is clearly not the right description of what's going on. But this is, I mean, this is just the most trivial of examples. In fact, we know for the fact, for a fact, that the, the tensor model is wrong. We know that tissue microstructure is much, much more complicated than the tensor would imply. So, what are the the ways that we could go about this? And this is going to get a bit towards what Brian is going to be talking about. So I won't go on about this for very long. Um, but just to give you a flavor, what are some of the things we could do? Well, one thing we could do is say, okay, the tensor is not describing what I want. I don't necessarily actually need a more complex model. In fact, sometimes a simpler model might be a better thing to do. If what I care about is, is, is directional, um, is, is the direction of water diffusion, why don't I just model that? And so this is a model that we've um, used a lot in, in our um, diffusion tractography, actually, is to say that we, we don't really care very much about what's happening perpendicular to the primary orientation. All we care about is getting a very, very good estimate of that direction. And so if we sacrifice accuracy of, of what's happening perpendicular to diffusion and just focus on the, the orientation itself, now we have a model that may only need three parameters in order to fit. We have a, 
um, the, the isotropic diffusion, so it's just soaking up all of the signal that is moving in, a, in another direction. We have diffusion along this stick, and then we have the fraction of the two compartments, and that's three parameters to describe um, the process of directional diffusion. And you can get surprisingly um, far with, with that kind of a simple model. Another uh, approach that you could take is to say, okay, well, the tensor is actually pretty good. It actually does a pretty good job of, of describing data. It's quite um, a robust measure. So maybe I could just extend that sort of one stage further. And this is what diffusion kurtosis does, or at least this is my, my um, uh, understanding of what diffusion kurtosis does, is that what you're looking at is, so if, a, if, if, a, um, if the tensor is describing um, the, the, the variance of that diffusion displacement, so if we, had a, if we had a Gaussian, we just need to know its variance and then we know everything about it. Here, what this is saying is, okay, go to the next higher order moment, um, which is referred to as, as kurtosis. And kurtosis basically just says, how peaky is that distribution? Okay, fine, it's not quite a Gaussian, but is it, is it very peaky or is it very broad? And this is what diffusion, uh, cur sorry, kurtosis describes. And this just reflects heterogeneity of the tissue environment. So this is something that you, you might imagine using, um, for example, if you're, uh, if, if, if you're wanting to look at a disease process and you want to, to try and um, come up with something that might be targeted toward um, main membrane integrity, for example. Um, the other major area of, of um, uh, improvement in the last um, 10 years has been in, in looking at voxels containing multiple fibers. Um, 10 years ago, there really wasn't any particularly robust methods for, for extracting this kind of information. Um, but today, the, there are um, uh, many different approaches um, with various merits. Um, the, the, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's a sort of exactly the same um, question that I've just been talking about, repeated, but now for multiple fibers. So should we be using, um, you know, simple models with just a, a few different sticks? Should we be using multiple tensors? Or should we be coming up, coming up with more sophisticated models? And I think um, a lot of the more sophisticated models are starting to produce some, some um, very impressive um, uh, um, descriptions of complex architecture. Nevertheless, um, it still remains the, the case that actually these simple models, where you just a model um, a few um, sticks which are represent diffusion along specific directions, are actually able to get you pretty far in terms of things like tractography. So uh, what I'm going to conclude with is a little bit about biological interpretation, because this is something that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few years. Um, and this comes back to this question of integrity. So early on, I was saying that various tensor measures reflect tissue integrity. And I sort of hinted that that, that was perhaps a bit vague and, and waffly. And so this is a bit where I'm going to get to why that is a vague and waffly thing to say. So what is fiber integrity? People will often detect a change in FA and say, ah, we detected a change in fiber integrity. Nobody outside of the diffusion community ever talks about fiber integrity. Biologists don't know what this means, right? So what, what does it mean when you say that, that fiber integrity has been compromised or something like this? Um, well, we don't know, because changes in FA could come from many different places. And I'll choose one example. Um, I, I, I do actually really love this study, but um, it, it is also a very good example of um, where you have to sort of stop in what you can do with measures like FA. And this is a study that came out of our lab, so this is Heidi Johansenberg's group, and Heidi is very, um, very well aware of all of these, these, these it messinesses of interpretation of changes in FA. Um, and what Heidi did is um, she and her uh, student Jan Schultz taught people how to juggle. Um, so people who never juggled before, they gave them a, a few months of, of, tr of training on this. And then they went and they looked to see, could they see any changes in FA before versus after learning to juggle? And I, th I still think it's absolutely remarkable that you, you can see this. So they, they found in this sort of parietal region here, which I, as I understand is, um, is related to sort of visual spatial something, um, that you can, yeah, this is, this, is, this is where we get outside of my expertise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but no, this is actually the region that they, that they were, that they 
we're hoping most to, to be able to, to, to detect a change. So this very subtle, um, I mean, you know, obviously it's not that, uh, you know, learning to juggle is an easy thing to do, but, you know, compared to a lot of the, the sort of plastic changes that we might think that we would be looking for, it is quite a subtle effect. And yet, they're able to detect a change in FA in this region. The problem is, they don't know what that means. So if you see a change in FA, what does it mean? And here I'm actually looking at the opposite of what they found. So they found an increase in FA. What do you, how, so here I'm just depicting what, wh how might you come up with a reduction in FA? Because you know, usually you would think, ah, okay, you know, the, the, the axons are breaking down, the membranes are breaking down, and so water is more free to diffuse across the fibers than it, um, than it normally would be. But actually, there's lots of things that could lead to this. You could have um, axons that are more loosely packed for some reason. You could have um, less orderly packing, so they're just not as coherent. You could have a secondary fiber population that is upregulated, and that could lead to a reduction in FA. All of these things could lead to a change in FA, and you just don't know which one you're looking at. So one of the things that I think you should expect to see in the next sort of five, ten years it are methods that aim to get around some of this ambiguity. So here what I'm depicting um, is uh, the way that people who think a lot about biophysical models of diffusion in tissue, how the one of some, of the, some of the ways that they try to sort of categorize the different um, scenarios that you might find yourself in, and how would that translate into a change in the diffusion signals that you might measure. So you'll often hear people refer to um, restricted diffusion and hindered diffusion. And it's important to know what they mean by those terms. So free diffusion is simply free diffusion. It's the diffusion that you have in a glass of water. It is determined entirely by the diffusion coefficient of, um, of that uh, material that you're looking at. Restricted diffusion describes uh, the, the condition that I, I hinted at in um, the introduction, um, where you have water molecules that are trapped inside a space. So they're confined to that space and they cannot leave it. So in this case, obviously what we have is something that's very, very different from diffusion. Because in diffusion, you know, the whole idea is if you wait long enough, particles can displace any arbitrary distance. Here, that is absolutely not the case. In this system, these water molecules will never leave the compartment. And that has a very important implication that I'll come to in a minute for how the, 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 um, the diffusion signal behaves. Then there's this kind of intermediate regime that's referred to as hindered diffusion. And generally what people mean by hindered diffusion is that you have a situation, so for example, as we would have um, in the extracellular space, where water molecules are trying to diffuse about at their, at their natural rate. But because they're bumping into boundaries, um, they are unable to diffuse quite as far as they would otherwise. So in this case, they can still displace an arbitrary distance because they can communicate between these sort of confining spaces in the, uh, in the extracellular space. But they're much reduced in terms of how quickly they can move. So hindrance, then, is exactly the space in between these two. Molecules can displace an arbitrary distance, <coughs> but they do so much more slowly than they would if those, um, if those uh, hindering boundaries were not there. So this then is, is one example of how this, um, this, this assumption of Gaussianity can be violated. Um, if we have restrictions or hindrances, things will no longer behave the way that we might expect. And I'll show you um, an example of what that would look like in a moment. Um, the key factor here that we have missed out on in making simple assumptions such as we do for, um, for, for a diffusion tensor, is we've neglected to think about the diffusion time. And the diffusion time is incredibly important. So what do I mean by diffusion time? I just mean how long after we tag those molecules position do we allow them to move before we, we make our measurement, before we look at them. And this is important because diffusion time um, is actually the axis along which you would say that something is restricted or is hindered. So here I'm showing you on the top free diffusion. Here we have a simple um, restrictive space where we have uh, two cylinders um, at perpendicular angles uh, to each other with water molecules diffusing inside them. And what you see is that if you, if you make a very rapid measurement, so you don't allow the molecules to, to, to diffuse for very long, there is no difference between these two cases. They are identical. The water molecules haven't encountered the boundaries yet, so they haven't had the opportunity to, to have the, the process of diffusion altered. 
The longer you wait, though, the more the water molecules explore that environment more fully. And that's the point at which you can start to see restriction. And that's the point at which you get this sort of slightly funny behavior that if you were to apply the standard diffusion model to this and estimate a diffusion coefficient, you would estimate a lower diffusion coefficient. You would say that the diffusion is going down because water molecules are not displacing as far as you would expect them to over that given time. So this concept of having a time-dependent diffusion is quite, is quite a funny thing, but it is actually key. It's a sort of the key observation that has, um, has enabled a lot of advanced methods that try to get at more specific and in biologically meaningful measurements about these, the underlying microstructure. For example, what is my axon diameter? Right? What this is telling you is that actually, if you were to look at, um, at, the, uh, at the diffusion time behavior, you would expect to be able to back out some information about the axon diameter just based on how much does the diffusion process appear to slow down. And that takes us to the propagator. So the propagator is something that we, um, we, we, we tend, so people in, the, in sort of work researching diffusion think about the propagator a lot. And we sort of keep it greedily to ourselves and don't share it with you all. But um, so today I'm going to share it with you. The propagator is really important. The propagator is describing everything that I, I, I was just um, telling you about. So the propagator is just a function that describes how diffusing molecules displace as a function of diffusion time. So for example, here, um, I have a cylinder. And at short diffusion times, we would expect the water molecules to displace um, very similarly as to is in, in um, uh, unrestricted free diffusion. But over time, those water molecules are going to, whoop. okay, try that again. I don't know why it stopped. Um, over time, the water molecules are going to fill out this space. So in other words, if I wait a very, very long time, then a water molecule that started in the center of the, the axon is equally likely to be any, anywhere inside that whole cylinder by the end of the measurement, right? And this is blatantly not Gaussian diffusion. It's Gaussian diffusion at very short times, but at long times it is not. And using this kind of a framework of a propagator, just saying, I'm going to just describe over time how the water molecules displace into whatever the confining space is, is a completely general framework for considering fairly complex systems. Much more complex, for example, than just a cylinder. You can use this to describe pretty much any geometry, as long as you have either enough you know, computation um, uh, uh, resources or you know, a very, very clever Russian mathematician to do it for you. Um, so uh, the whole game then is to basically, let's remove the effect of, of diffusion time, which we've kind of muddled in with the quantification that we're trying to do. We've let the process that we're trying to look at get mixed up with the measurement, and that's not a good thing. So what we need to do is separate the two things. B value combined them. B value actually had two terms in it. So I described B value as relating to the area of this gradient, um, so that the time of it and the, the, the amplitude of it. Um, in fact, it also depends on the diffusion time. So the first thing we need to do is, is basically throw out B value because it mixes things up and instead talk about Q value, which is just the area under this gradient. One way you can think about what Q means is it's just a spatial scale. So it's just describing, for example, um, over uh, what distance you would expect to, to have um, some, amount of, um, uh, uh, some, some amount of phase accrual. So the distance over which, a, say, 2 pi phase accrual would, would occur. That's what Q describes, if that, if that appeals to you. OK, so we, we, we separate those effects out. And the reason why we do that is because then we're left with a very simple and elegant framework, which is that if we look at our measurement now not along um, uh, an axis that is B value, but Q value, our measurement is the Fourier transform of this diffusion propagator. Kay? So if that doesn't immediately appeal to you, basically what I'm saying is you just you have a very simple mathematical operation that allows you to go from some measurement that you made into this is how the molecules have displaced inside your voxel. And that then allows you to say, I mean, here you can see very clearly that if you, if you saw a propagator that looked like this, then you would be able to say, okay, what I'm dealing with is something like a cylinder, and this is its radius. Um, 
I'm going to skip this, I think, to show you this. So this is the last, um, the last slide that I have then. Um, which is axon diameter measurements. So this is sort of demonstrating this concept um, where they've acquired um, measurements, uh, in this case, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. yes, in the, in, yeah, so this was, I believe, a, a multi-Q value measurement. You can either do this with by varying the diffusion time or varying um, uh, this Q value. Uh, but what they were able to do um, is to demonstrate that they can estimate not, not now just a single axon, because you don't expect to have an, a, an axon, a uniform axon diameter within an imaging voxel. You expect there to be some distribution. But they were able to demonstrate that for two different bits of white matter, so optic and uh, sciatic nerve, that they were able to um, estimate the distribution of axon diameters in that voxel and compare that to um, uh, counting that they did um, on electron microscopy and show that there was actually a remarkable correspondence between the two. So this is then the sort of measurement that you could imagine making uh, in the condition where you actually wanted to make a specific statement about what is changing in the underlying microstructure. And there are various, it's, it's not just axon diameter measurements that people are trying to get at, there's various other things such as you know, permeability of axons, the size of the, you know, um, uh, the extracellular space, which would tell you about things like packing, all of those sorts of things. So um, with that, I will conclude um, by saying that what I've been discussing, except for this last bit, really are, is just the most common methods. I, I haven't, I haven't g gotten really into any of the sort of more exotic methods that um, are in, in less use, but uh, some of which are probably going to become um, more common over the, the coming years. There are alternatives to the way that, that we were um, achieving diffusion contrast in the signal. There are alternatives to having to acquire single-shot EPI images, and obviously both of these things will have implications for data quality. Finally, um, there's definitely a lot of um, uh, really interesting research being done looking at models for diffusion in tissue, and one of the, the key things that hopefully you've gotten a feel for is that you know there are these two approaches. Um, one is I'm going to have a biophysically motivated model that I think describes the tissue. And the other is I'm going to have a data-driven model that describes the effects of the data that I care about in order, for example, to do tractography. And those are two very different things. Um, and finally, there is in general this trade-off of sensitivity for specificity. This, that is something that the diffusion community is, is sort of trying to, to grapple with. So uh, with that, I will thank you. Uh, well, thanks for coming, and uh, nice, to, nice to see all of you here. Um, I actually grew up in New York, and uh, my dad had his office just uh, across the street on Park Avenue South, not far from here. So coming back here always evokes all these old memories, and uh, so it's a particular pleasure. Uh, I, I wanted to follow, so Carla was, um, I, I thought, like the rest of you, that she did a really nice job uh, explaining the uh, acquisition of the data and think, and, and also took uh, a good step into how one might think about the data and process it. Uh, and I'm going to uh, do the, I'm going to follow in her footsteps. I'm going to take a couple of uh, interludes before I get there to talk about the brain and neuroscience and why it is that somebody like me, who's somebody who's thought about the brain, uh, would be interested in acquire, spending as much time as we have in uh, thinking about the data and the acquisition methods and so forth and what we, wa we want to use it for. And I want to tell you this story. And in fact, there's going to be, I got about 90 minutes, and I've got about seven or eight little stories that I'll be telling you during those 90 minutes, uh, about 10 minutes each. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that we're going through together. And the bad news is that there's a lot of stuff. And the good news is that if you don't like what I'm talking about now, and 10 minutes later, it'll be something completely different. <laughs> so just hang in there with me. OK, so the first bit is what are the neuroscience issues? And there's actually a large fight going on. It might be not, you know, sub rose a little bit, but there's a kind of debate going on as to what it is exactly we should be focused on in studying the brain generally and the human brain in particular. And I'm going to spend about five, eight minutes laying out those set of issues and uh, how I've become convinced that studying the white matter and the properties of the glia uh, axons and uh, white matter of the human brain is actually quite important and understudy. And I think we can do better. And I think uh, what Carla described as an example of the ways in which the instruments are now permitting us to make those measurements that haven't been possible in the past. Then I'm going to pull back uh, after that broad introduction 
I'm going to pull back and start looking at the diffusion signals that are produced by these kinds of measurements inside of a single voxel and talk about that. And that'll relate to the kinds of things that many of the questions that came up on, well, well you know, how many directions do we need? What is parallel? What is radial axial diffusion? All those kinds of terms. And I'll introduce those terms. Uh, I'll then spend a, uh, a little more time than Carla did on talking about how data from individual voxels gets knitted together into these estimates of uh, what we either call tracts or fascicles. I tend not to use the word axon because axons are a micron or two across. They're not that close to what we're going to see, but what we're going to be able to measure. But in the human brain, in the human brain, the uh, tracts that start out in one piece of cortex and go to another piece of cortex um, end up being uh, a, of a size that are, you know, a couple of millimeters across. So you can actually get at them with the kinds of resolution that Carla and the MR community has provided to us. And uh, then I'll say, uh, you know, kind of how we hope to do something good for society uh, in all this. So first off, let me just make a, start with this picture that reminds us all that the human brain, the macaque brain, and the mouse brain are different from one another. Sometimes in reading a journal article, it's hard to recognize that. But the human brain is, is about uh, 3,000 times bigger. And for the point of view of what I'm going to uh, lecture on today, uh, I want to emphasize that size matters a lot uh, for, because if you have a, a brain that's, say, 10 centimeters from one place to another, communicating across that extent is a real issue you have to solve as an engineer. And the notion that the white matter solves that for us is, a, is an important notion. And the mouse brain uh, and smaller animals don't have that same problem to solve. All of the pieces of cortex are in relatively close proximity to, the, to one another. So that when you are in uh, looking at that species, it doesn't come to you. It's not like motivating to you to say, oh, I should really study the white matter because look at it. It's so giant. It's not giant. But in the human brain, it is giant. And there's a whole set of cells and properties uh, of the white matter that must have evolved to do something important in terms of communication and structuring and processing in the uh, human brain. So this is a picture. And, and I have noticed that, by the way, I'm new to this in the sense that I, you know, um, I, as Dave kindly reminded me, I've been at Stanford 35 years. <laughs> and and the, the first 25 of those, I really didn't think about white matter at all. So I'm not telling you this is like, oh, gee, I've been on this bandwagon for a long time. I didn't know this stuff. And I have, but I have become passionate about it and thinking about it over the last 10 years. And uh, let me just ha have a look at it, because I didn't have a look at it uh, until really quite recently. If you look at the tracts in the human brain, and mostly this is how they have been looked at in postmortem dissection, you can see them with the naked eyes. And you can see those bundles there aren't individual axons. They're groups of axons that travel together, usually called fascicles. You'll often hear me use the word fascicle in the, in the presentation. And these are some of the principal fascicles in the human brain. And they're surrounded by all kinds of specialized cells that matter to your ability to think, process, and do things. And this number here is just a number I like to needle my friends. And I have many of them. I shouldn't overdo it. I mean, the work on mouse has been tremendously important. But I often needle them with the relative sizes of these things. Uh, and it really, and I think size has a big effect in terms of how much um, engineering goes into the design of these different parts. OK, so let me say that uh, for those of you who are relatively new to this, just as a reminder, neurons are in the, are in the cortex, the sheath that covers it. The long range uh, connections are here in the white matter. That's what you're looking at here. And uh, sometimes people refer to, act to the fascicles as if they're wires uh, in the sense that this is a wire. Well, it, they, they are wires. They do serve that function. But they're active wires. And what I mean by that is they change massively during development. And some of the data that Carla showed from uh, Heidi Johansson Berg, and I'll show others from Asaf, and we have tons of, tons of the stuff also, show that in response to learning and memory and the experiences that you've had, your wires change. So that these are actually active wires that are responsive to um, uh, certain types of events. Let me just zoom in with just a little glamour shot from uh, Douglas Fields and a Scientific American piece. Uh, one of the ways you can tell that a field is rising is when they get the nicest uh, graphics art attached to them and so forth. And so there's been a lot of graphics arts. I'll show you a couple 
of the, of the white matter connections. Uh, I want to make sure that you are, know this word here, oligodendrocyte. These are a type of glial cells, that's glial cell that fills, that's in the white matter. And its output, its processes over here, uh, form the myelin sheath that wraps the axon. So you got one glial cell, and that glial cell will wrap an axon. It might wrap half a dozen or, or a dozen different axons at different parts. And if you're thinking that nature hasn't figured out a way to take advantage of the fact that this single cell will wrap uh, six, eight, or ten axons together and possibly have a common effect, you haven't been paying attention because nature kind of does a lot of stuff when, when you're not looking at it and figure stuff out. So the oligodendrocytes matter a lot for the myelin sheath. They're in there and uh, they're a potential source of control of uh, the way in which signals are carried out along here. Astrocytes uh, play a role and uh, let me take you to a better list. This is just to give you a sense of that. Here, here is a picture. I think you might have shown the same picture. Anyway, there's one very beautiful electron micrograph that many of us use. Note the scale bar for 500 nanometers over here uh, of the myelin sheath wrapping this stuff. Uh, when Carla was talking about water and interacting with myelin, uh, you know, the water molecules actually are inside of these little wraps, uh, which are just a couple of nanometers across. It's only about uh, 10 nanometers from wrap to wrap. And that water also gives the signal. So the probing that MR does is, is quite really remarkable. There's all kinds of uh, glial cells and other stuff in the space around it that are, uh, exist as barriers to diffusion, which is what I'll be getting to in a little bit. And I just wanted to uh, focus on the fact that some of these glial cells, like the microglia, are extremely active uh, in terms of taking away dead tissue or when axons degenerate moving them out of there, encapsulating parts of uh, other cells and so forth. They're very active. And that's true both in the white matter and in the gray matter. And as I say, there's a big push now to think about the role of glia and the role of non uh, cells that are not neurons uh, in maintaining the activity and communications uh, of the brain as a whole. So this is a big deal for me right now. So I mentioned microglia, 20%, astrocytes, about 50%, oligodendrocytes that produce the myelin sheath uh, are, are there in, in about 20% density. The um, Schwann cells are, are the oligodendrocytes of the periphery. So that was, took me a long time to figure out. They, if you're in the periphery and you wrap, you're a Schwann cell. If you're in the central nervous system, and if you're in the brain and you're wrapping the oligodendrocyte. Okay, so. Uh, this, I just, I'm, throughout this, I'm going to sprinkle the names of people who have had an impact on me and who I think are smart and did uh, and move things along in interesting ways. I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm going to miss some people, but I don't, I'm, at the expense, I'm still going to mention some. And I particularly want to mention Ted Bullock, who was a magnificent neuroscientist, passed away a little while ago, was, uh, down in San Diego. And uh, he and Fields and Eve Martyr, um, this whole bunch of folks over, over here, just said, look, people, it's time to get over this obsession with the neuron and to look at these other cells as well. And they lay out their arguments in this piece that I wanted to advertise uh, in, a, in a really nice way. And I think, we sh I think they're right. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, in the human work, uh, there has been, because of the nature of the tools, there has been a lot of looking at the, um, prop the changes of the properties of diffusion following learning and so forth. And you had the juggling study. There's a couple, there's a couple of juggling studies, right? There's, there's one, some, uh, some BBM one earlier, and then the Johansson Berg one. And now, uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of these uh, things here from, um, I, I guess I'm thinking of Asaf as being the leader of the little uh, push on this, that's showing that, it's, it's, that these changes in the diffusion are probably picking up glial changes that are present in the gray matter in the actual, in the cortex itself, as opposed to in the white matter. And there's a whole series of studies that I'll have lots of references on that are showing that learning of certain sorts, such as learning to read or emotional regulation, uh, such as in depression, uh, have a, um, a corresponding set of signals that one can pick up in the white matter. And I think that's interesting, and I'm hoping that's why I'm doing it. So that was my first. That was my first ten minutes. And in fact, I make a plea here. This is a piece that Jason Yateman and I wrote uh, to to say that 
there are some kinds of things that um, people work on that are very well suited to the action potential and postsynaptic potentials. I mean, you can't imagine. I mean, look how they're obviously enormously important. I mean, you have to be nuts not to put action potentials first, right? But on the other hand, there are certain kinds of things that you do that, like learning to read or learning to become attached to your family and so forth, uh, or, or your emotional regulation, that probably depend on structures that change substantially over time and, and hold that hold that set of properties that aren't kind of the instantaneous sub-millisecond measurement that I've got of a calcium, of, a, of, a, uh, of an action potential and so forth. These are things that kind of the brain settles into. And those are very important for society. And so I'll come back to this theme later, things like learning and so forth. And uh, I think the proliferation of glia, the way in which they wrap uh, the synapses and the way in which they wrap the axons and so forth are probably important topics uh, that we should all be looking at. And I'll come back to, uh, there's now probably two dozen studies of reading and reading development and so forth that have all shown the relationship between uh, reading development and properties of light. That's kind of home base for me. Okay, but Dave didn't ask me here to uh, come and be political with you about fights in um, neuroscience. He asked me to say things about diffusion and diffusion imaging. So here we go. And anytime you see another one of these little pictures, it means it's a, sec a section change. Okay, diffusion weighted terminology. This came up earlier in some of the questions from your colleague, uh, Arnold's colleague. Um, there's a lot of terminology here, and it takes a while to get used to it. Let me try to um, uh, move us through this. So this is a little piece. People often make this move in the study of diffusion. They'll go to a particular piece of the brain where they'll know what the properties are, like the corpus callosum, all the axons are going straight through. And then they'll work out some of the experimental um, methods there. So here's a little piece of the brain, an optic nerve tract, which largely is, has all the axons aligned in the same way. It has dis some distribution of sizes, but uh, all aligned in the same way. And uh, as Carla explained, one can measure uh, the, what's called the apparent diffusion coefficient. Uh, in various directions along the main axis of the track, uh, you know, where you'll see the smallest signal and largest effective diffusivity, uh, that will be called the um, parallel or axial or longitudinal diffusion. Sorry for that, but that's just the way that I, I didn't make this stuff up. I'm just telling you the way it is out there. And that direction will also be often referred to as the PDD. So if you find yourself in a conversation, somebody says, PDD, that's what they mean. It means the, the main way in which stuff is going. Okay, so parallel axial longitudinal principle and so forth. And uh, here, this makes it look kind of like Carla's picture that uh, you know there's mostly just axons, and and there are you know axons really matter. But do remember that that extracellular space is filled with glia, uh, just not shown here. They've been washed away. That these are glia, you know, the, the oligodendrocytes and others that also present barriers to diffu diffusion. They tend to be oriented, um, but there they are. In the transverse direction, and that's another word, transverse, perpendicular, radial uh, diffusivity, uh, that's another measurement that you can make. People, I have noticed, I, uh, I started out as a color scientist some number of years ago, and I have noticed that um, color is three-dimensional, and people just hated it because it was three-dimensional. And they always are trying to take things that are intrinsically three, four, two dimensions and find one single number to describe them all. I, I can't, it's just human nature. So univariate statistics, so that people don't often want to report longitudinal and radial, you know, don't want to, the, long, the parallel and perpendicular. They want to tell you the ratio. But you do learn separate stuff from those two measures. And uh, the physicists actually, in the early literature, largely separated things into parallel and perpendicular and kept them around. And it was Peter and uh, uh, people who made it simpler for the cognitive neuroscientists who would report FA, fractional anisotropy, which, I'll, which is roughly, not quite, but roughly the ratio. Okay, so Carla uh, did a very nice job in describing the need for the B equals zero measurement, the non-diffusion measurement basically uh, without any diffusion gradient. And here's an example of an image on a typical image on a 3T, 3T scanner that shows a cross section. The eyes would be up here, back to head over here. Um, 
middle of the brain over here. And you can see that there's relative amounts of signal at different points that, um, ref that reflect the amount of diffusion. And, and actually, you know, things like the ventricles and so forth, uh, stuff moves around a little bit more than it does in, in other places. If you turn on a gradient like this one, you get a measurement like this one. So here's the uh, gradient. It's a very low value, 800. And I do that in this case to get a big signal. Uh, and you can see the gradients in this direction. And some stuff that was light now turned dark because the, signal, because the protons were diffusing, uh, in, particularly in, in the direction that would, in that direction that the protons at those locations are diffusing in that direction. And that really darkens the signal, just as, as Carla described. If we change the direction of the gradient, uh, and these, these are the data that we work with, the signal changes, right? So I'll just flip back and forth. One direction, another direction. Okay, so it's, it's, that, that's the way it is. And, and by the way, Dave, um, I looked at this one. I thought about you because of I thought of new descending the staircase. And, and, and can you see the uh, visual illusion in there, the motion illusion? When Dave was a young guy, which is a really long time ago, uh, <laughs> one of the first things he did was a motion illusion. And, uh, stimuli like like this one were the ones that he that he ended up using phase shifts with this. this, this that's, sorry, inside the beltway stuff. Okay, um, the other important direction uh, that Carla mentioned uh, it was measurements of different D values, and it's true that's quite common clinically to use 800 or 1,000 as a as a good number for the B value. Uh, and uh, but notice this, I'm going to show you a series of different B values. Now I'm going to fix the direction over here. So this is a B value of 1,000. Uh, and you can see a little darkening over here and a little lighter on either side like this. The signal size is big. Uh, signal size itself, these are scanner units, so they're you know, arbitrary, but, they're, but it's a pretty big signal. Now I'm going to go to 2,000, uh, which is where we do most of our measurements. And you can see that the contrast here is a little easier, but the signal is a little bigger. So you can see this across here easily. Uh, the signal amplitude is dropped quite a bit, so it depends. If you're interested in the absolute size of the signal or in signal to noise, you might use 1,000. Uh, for some purposes, you, you might want to go up to 2,000. So here you can see it's dropped. And then uh, I'll show you one at 4,000, uh, where now the signal has dropped quite a bit lower. This peak is quite a bit lower. The contrast, the directional sensitivity, is quite high. But you can see how noisy it is. Uh, and so that the signal to noise really changes as you go from 1,000 to 2,000 to 4,000. That's not rocket science. You know, there's reasons why you might want to do one, and reasons why you might want to do the other, and it depends what you're looking at and why you're looking at that. And that's what we're supposed to help you figure out here, that you, you need to kind of make a, make a choice. I, I, Stephen will talk about the choice that um, was made or is being made for the um, Human Connectome Project. And that's a kind of different situation. I mean, those guys have a problem of delivering a perfect data set that's you know, created for a particular reason for sharing, so forth. It's a very important responsibility, and it's a cool project. And they have to make a decision. But I'm looking at you, and I don't know, there's 75 of you out there, and you all get to make your own decision when you collect your own data, unless we think that the HCP will be the last time anybody collects the fusion data. Not likely. But, so, but it's a good time, and it's going to be very valuable. We're already downloading and using those. So, uh, but there will be other reasons to make other measurements in other populations for other purposes. And so these choices are open for you. Okay, next section. So I pointed out to you that at any particular voxel, you make a measurement in this direction, this direction, this direction, so forth. So if you're somebody who used to work in color vision, you're somebody who would be used to thinking about the shapes of these surfaces as they come on out. Because it's an unusual and interesting data set. For every little location in the brain, you actually have a shape that you measure that's telling you something about the underlying tissue at that location in that box on the brain. And uh, so we're going to talk about how one represents signals in three space. And I'm going to talk really, because I think there are, honestly, there are days I wake up and think these are the only two models Really, uh, people use a lot of words, but I don't think there are a lot of other uh, ideas uh, besides those models. So here's a picture. These are actually data from, uh, I think these are measured at equal 4,000, maybe 2,000. It doesn't really matter. An example of what the data look like on a smooth surface from one single voxel and one single person in the brain and 
one particular experiment. These, just to give you a sense of what we routinely run, these, might, these were either one and a half or two millimeter isotropic voxels and 150 directions. And, and so we had a pretty dense sampling around here, and we did it you know, for, for purposes that are, uh, I, anyway, I'll tell you over a beer what we did it for. So here's, so here's a Steskel tanner equation that um, Carla was emphasizing. And at every direction, you've got something. And the, the color here indicates the, um, I should be using this, right? The color indicates the relative um, signal relative to the B equals zero case. Okay, so it's the signal that you measure relative to the B equals zero case. And Carla gave you a test to ask, well, uh, when the signal is really small, what does that mean? So in there, that's where the signal is small. That means that that's the way things were diffusing a lot. And where it pops out over there, that means where things are not moving very much. Okay, so that's what you can look at something like that and see that. You can also see all these little bumps on the signal over here. And you know, if you're a, I have to say, if you're a, I, I, are there any theoretical physicists in this room? Okay, okay, well anyway, I, I like theoretical physicists. I count them as amongst some of my good friends. But you know, there's almost nothing that, you know, any little thing in the data, they, they are used to instrumentation and a world in which they can measure stuff with such precision that they take everything seriously. But Heger and I are psychologists. And we look at little bumps on stuff like that, and we just start out assuming that it's not reliable. And the truth in this field is somewhere in between. So the first thing that we started looking at was what's the reliability of these kinds of bumps, and what kinds of models would you use to fit these shapes? And that's what I'm going to tell you about uh, now. OK, so the first big model, and, it, and it, it's really an important model, and it plays a role everywhere. And it comes from Peter Basser and Carlo Pierpoli and uh, Denny Lubihan, and there's a kind of a crowd of people. If you ever wonder what the NIH, if you ever wonder what the government did for you, just think of Peter Basser. Because Peter works at the NIH and has done a lot of great stuff. And uh, I, I'm thrilled that the government sometimes actually supports great stuff like this. So Peter you know, looked at this equation. There's a lot of fancy math, and there's a lot of stuff, stuff behind, behind it and so forth. But he said, look, suppose we, we tried to summarize these surfaces by looking at the diff, diffuse, uh, apparent diffusion coefficient. So it's shown in here as d as a function of the angle that we're making the measurement. And I made a simple uh, model. My model was that it was Gaussian. Gaussian turns out, in this case, to, to be equivalent to saying that the effective diff, diffusion, by the way, the reason it's called effective diffusion or apparent diffusion is because diffusion refers to diffusion in a homogeneous medium. And the brain's not homogeneous. So he couldn't get this stuff published in physics literature, calling it diffusion, because they say, well, it's not diffusion in a homogeneous medium. So he so called it effective diffusion, or apparent diffusion. Anyway, so, so let's look at that diffusion term. And let's model it this, by using a quadratic form. So there's a three by three matrix. This is the direction of the gradient over here. And he says, you know, I bet that I could predict this, but if you give me the direction and a symmetric three by three positive definite, quadra positive definite quadratic form, I could predict this. And that's what uh, you know, Einstein and the physicists had developed for this. That positive definite just means that the, that the matrix is, uh, can be divided into A times A transpose. And both of these are not singular. So in any event, so the diffusion over here sits up over here. And that's a model of what it is that you're supposed to see in the uh, C in the box. That's that. That's where the qu that's quadratic is where that ellipsoid shape comes from. And that's what, you, what you're supposed to see. And so that means you take data like this at 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 over here, all these different points. I'm going to put this up here so you can see this. Um, at all these different points. And uh, you summarize it by uh, one of these quadratic models, the diffusion tensor model over here from, uh, from Peter's work uh, in each one of these cases. And if you're, some people would look at this and say, my god, you're losing all kinds of information, for God's sake. I mean, look at all these little things and nooks and crannies and all kinds of delicious stuff going on there. And over here, you're summarizing it with this unbelievably smooth model. So that caused a big ruckus. I mean, there's some people who thought that it was OK. I think it's, and I'm going to, I didn't know what it was OK. I'm going to tell you what I think in a moment. 
And then uh, other people thought, oh, that's just terrible. It's like I've, I've had very smart people I respect a lot come up to me and almost in a spitting rage say, this is the worst thing that ever happened in the fusion industry, this diffusion tensor model. Uh, okay. Here's the other way to look at it. Uh, and there are many mathematical wraps on this. And you'll hear things like spherical, constrained spherical harmonic deconvolution, a lot of, a lot of things. But there's a core idea under almost all of them, uh, which is this, so the ball and sticks model, which I think, uh, I, I don't know who was first. It might have been independent. Uh, Larry Frank has a series of just really beautiful articles around 2002 using this idea. Tim Behrens, who's your colleague, uh, used it around that same time. Uh, it's a good idea. And uh, the idea is that, well, there's a diffusion that's symmetric in all directions. We don't know exactly where it comes from. Some is from inside the axon. Some is from outside the axon. But there's some symmetric part. Then there's a kind of stuff that we care about, which would be in each voxel, there might be some axons going this way. If that's all there is, you got one stick. If there's axons going two ways, well, you got two sticks and so forth. And the package that you download from, I don't know if you, you were on these papers, weren't you? Anyway. So the packages that you guys wrote uh, go and test ideas in, in ways that, uh, as to how many sticks you need and, and so forth to describe a particular voxel. And I think that is the, the core, that is the core idea. And it, it's, a, it's a, we're gonna call, so it predicts the diffusion signal in a voxel with a model. And when Dave was asking his questions before, Carla said, well, why don't you get enough data to go and get an excellent model that seems like a good idea to me. And um, I'm always correlated with Dave. OK, so here's an example in which you would use a ball and stick sticks model uh, to hear some measured data. And uh, here's what the ball and stick model uh, approximation to those data would be like. And you can see that shape is a little bit different from the tensor shape. In that It's got uh, two places where things are, are, pointing, are pointing and so forth. So we're interested in how. Um, how to do this, I should say that the implementation of how to do this calculation um, is, uh, I, I think, still open. I think that there's work to be done on this. Um, these guys did a great job in Oxford. There's a group in Australia uh, with a very nice package, Mr. Trick's package, that implements the estimation of these things and so forth. Uh, we looked at it, too. Uh, we, we kind of prefer big, open, easy to understand pieces of code for things that are as simple as these kinds of problems like weighted sums of a few terms. So uh, Ariel Rokum, when I say we, uh, what I mean is Ariel Rokum, uh, implemented a open package called Osmosis for going and estimating these. And um, we've done, used Ariel's work a lot to, tr to try to compare the diffusion tensor model and what we call the sparse fascicle model, SFM, which is really the ball and sticks model. Uh, it's, not, it's just that model. But we, we decided to call it, give it this name, SFM, because the ball and sticks model just seemed like a bad idea to us. And, and we estimated the model using just linear methods with sparseness constraints. We didn't do a lot of um, complicated stuff, just linear. It's a linear model. And we estimated the linear model with sparseness constraints. So um, that, that's it. As I say, this, it's the same ideas in spherical deconvolution and other and related estimation methods. OK, so the one thing now, and, and this, is, uh, this is a big one for me. So let me take a breath and separate this out for you. I've just told you about two different models, the diffusion tensor model and the sparse fascicle model. And they're both going to be used to fit the data. And if they did equally well in fitting the data, I can tell you I would 100% for sure use the sparse fascicle model because the diffusion tensor model is a phenomenological description of the data. It's very close to the data. It arises from your predictions of just the, the shapes. Whereas the sparse fascicle model is one that's built on logical constructs that, that feel like axons and, and stuff just, you know, isotropic diffusion and so forth. It's got at its core ideas that I care about. And the diffusion tensor model has it at, at its core an effort to fit the data. It doesn't have a kind of biological structure. Sparse fascicle model is just the beginning. We're going to use quantitative stuff and other kinds of MR methods to learn more and more and more about the biology. And this, these ball and stick models 
do a good job of getting us in that, getting us started there at the beginning. So I would prefer to use it if it, if it does about as well, and I just want to get you set up for that. Okay. Uh, by the way, and there will be a PDF of this linked out somewhere. Uh, all these slides, you don't need to take pictures or anything. All these slides will be available online. Be fine. And, and, and I sometimes, because I know I'm not going to get to mention certain people, I, I put references in and places for you to go and look, look for stuff. Okay, so how would you compare these models? What would you, what would you do? Okay, so let's do it. So, well, okay, you got this model. As I said, it's a phenomenological model, uh, the diffusion tensor model, that assumes Gaussian distribution. And um, you, would, you would normally test a model like this using, in the modern age, that everyone uses the word cross-validation. It's always, you, you, you can't go anywhere without somebody trying to cross-validate you. And, and, and they're right. It's a good thing to do. I'm not objecting to it. We just used to call it testing it on independent data sets. The old days, but now I, I'm very modern. I cross-validate. It's good. So you go and you take the model and you fit it to a data set, and you do you get your model and you fit it. Now you repeat your measurements. Say I've got Eli in there. I've got him in the scanner. I go get one set of measurements. Uh, I set those aside. I, I do it again right afterwards. Same set. Of, repeat, repeat them. Okay, right over there. Okay. So I take I fit my uh, my first data set, and then I see how well my model predicts the second data set uh, as co compared to, let's say, if I just assume that the data would replicate, uh, every value here should be the same over there. If it was perfect, that would be the root mean squared error between the two data sets. That would be like the data is just going to replicate perfectly. I'd like the model to do about as well as just the data replicating the data or better if possible. That would be good. So that's what you can do with the diffusion tensor model. And this is completely typical. We have all the data online and, and analyzed and so forth. This is how well the diffusion tensor model does. Uh, if you look at rep the first one, A over here, on the left, the left panel says measured once, measured again, and uh, these are different uh, signal uh, normalized signal values. And you, know, you can see the scatter, and that's the noise in your data. You measured it as, as you know, Boom, measured Eli once, measure them again, look at the noise, that's the scatter plot, there you go. Uh, I put a gray ellipsoid through this just as a covariance estimate, and I copied it and pasted it over here. If you fit the diffusion tensor model and look at the measured um, uh, and predicted, uh, so you take the first measurement and model it, and then you make a prediction over here on the, on to the, second, on to the second data set, so you take the model, and you predict the second data set, you do better, in fact. In fact, the, the diffusion tensor model in most of the brain, most places, actually is a better predictor of what you will measure next than actually going in and, and uh, assuming that it'll just replicate exactly. Okay, so it's not bad. I'm, I'm saying that's not bad. And um, in fact, we can do the same thing with a sphere. Uh, I'll show you more. I'll elaborate on this. We do this more with a sparse fascicle model. And uh, please note these axes. The best possible um, score you could get of replication to model, the best one could expect with Gaussian noise, actually has a number. And we write this out in the paper. And it's down here. It's 1 over the square root of 2. That's the best you could possibly do if your model is absolutely perfect. Notice the scale goes up to 0.78. And at low B values, B equal 1,000, uh, the two models do about equally well across the entire brain. Now, these are average across the entire brain, uh, with the diffusion tensor model being like a hair's worse than the uh, sparse fascicle model. When you go up to 2,000, you see a little bit of a separation. And then 4,000, a little more of a separation. But look, this, these are small separations. Let's not get too excited here. This is, so the sparse fascicle model does as well or better across these B values. I told you I liked it better anyway, because it has kind of biological underpinning. That's good. So, so far, I'm just kind of sticking with this. And let me now show you another thing about it, just to unpack it. If you look at examples of where it's doing well and badly, if you look at the diffusion tensor model at a case where the, you know, it does the worst at B equal 4,000, and this is the place where it does the worst, uh, and the color code here shows how well the model is doing relative to the prediction of just it replicates. It replicates versus the model predicts. So everything down here that's green or yellow over here says the model is 
is doing a better job at predicting the next data set than the first data set does at predicting the next data set. And so most, of, even in a bad plane like this, mostly uh, things are pretty good. But here's the worst part. The Centrum Semiovals a place of a lot of fiber crossing over here. It's an important place. And home base for me, the optic radiation is another place where, for whatever reason, I don't know why, I really would like to know this. Uh, the optic radiation, there's something special going on there. And actually, I can tell you the tissue properties are different in there. All kinds of stuff is different in the optic radiation. So we've been studying a weird part of the brain. Uh, and uh, that, I don't know what I think about that. If you do the same, let me go back and forth. If you do the same fits with a sparse fascicle model, it cleans it up a bit. Okay, so this is a diffusion tensor model, sparse fascicle model. Diffusion tensor, sparse fascicle. Sparse fascicle helps in there. It's still not great over here. It's pretty good. I mean, look, you know, it's, a, it's as good as replicating data. It's better than replicating data. But, it, but it's, uh, you know, all this other stuff, you do a lot better by fitting the model and working with that. So let me summarize what I told you now before we go to the next section. Um, first off, we really have great quantitative models of the diffusion signals within a voxel. These models are good. They, you go, you get a bunch of measurements, you model them, you're going to do great at predicting the next data set. And they're more, that's what's said here, they're more reliable predictors of independent me measurements. And so therefore, when you go and you do something like tractography, the thing that you think you might want to do is do your tractography not on the original data, but on the model fit to the data, because that's a more reliable, better uh, thing to do because it's taking advantage of all the different directions and statistical regularities and so forth. So I think you want to do your subsequent inference on the model fits to the data rather than the raw data itself. And I should say, there's a, a I'm, why am I telling you this? Well, there's a kind of a spitting match in the literature about we don't need no damn models. Or, yeah, no, models are kind of good. And no, 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 just use the raw data. No, no, no. I, I think there's a good reason to use the models. Mm -hmm. let, 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 let me, you, you didn't do that in the speaker, so I'm going to repeat your, so first off, what's your name? And from? Okay, so Mar Mar Mariana? Yes. From NYU, says there's a difference between precision and accuracy, and this is part of the whole um, cross-validation it's, a, it's an important distinction, and it's really uh, you know, part, of the, part of the world that we deal with all the time these days. And she's saying that your model is describing how well you, how accurately you describe the um, data. And that's true. That's exactly what I'm interested in. Uh, I'm not interested, and, and the, liter the diffusion literature is filled with assessments of how reliably you get the same PDD, um, principal diffusion direction, uh, how reliably you get that confronting some data. Is that parameter estimate the same when we measure again and again and again? And that question is not interesting to me because if that number is wrong, but reliably wrong, I don't care. I don't want to know. I want to know that my model is actually fitting the data. I could give you an unbelievably reliable S parameter estimate, zero. Uh, and that would be very reliable. That would be zero. It would just be wrong. So for me, the one that I'm quite interested in is how well these models do it, predicting the measurements. And then I will reason about the models later. But that's right. People often, I, this, as you can imagine, this is the first time I've had somebody say, is, is this accuracy or is this reliability and so forth? I'm interested in fitting the data. And, and that, that's right. Is that okay? Ah, so that's another question. No, now I, I want to be with. Now I want to be on Mariana's side on this one. The and I think I made that point, but I think you're making it again in a good way. So Mariana says, "Look, you, the diffusion tensor model might be fitting the data very well, and it does. It does. It fits the data very well. But the principal diffusion direction, there may not be a single axon in that whole voxel that actually." is going in that direction. And the way that happens, and it, and it happens actually fairly, it, it, it's not uncommon. It actually, this, this, is, this does happen. 
is you'll have one axon headed this way, you have another axon headed this way, and the, and the tensor that you'll get will look kind of like a pancake. You know, it'll be kind of thin, and, 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 and it'll be, it won't really go. It'll just be like a pancake. I don't know what else to say. And there will be a best direction, but mostly one track will be going this way, and another track will be going this way, and your, dif and your principal diffusion direction will be going that way, and that's bad, and that's bad. So the inference, and so we're on the same team here, that the inference that you make from the diffusion tensor model to tracks is a different story. And if I gave you any of you the impression that you could fit the diffusion tensor and accept the principal direction as being a track, no, don't do that. Don't, certainly don't say, I said it was OK. OK? <laughs> that, that, just, OK? That, that's the important. If that was your point, yeah, we're on the same team here. OK. We're all on the same team here. OK. Um, OK, Larry Frank. Remember, La even though I didn't say a lot about him, he was really good, he was really smart. It was very, very good stuff. OK, so I'm, I'm going to clean up a, few, a couple of little things now in this section before I go to track talk. Tractography will be next, but before I get there, uh, I want to clean up a few little things. So I didn't say much about integrating data across multiple v-values. Right? That wasn't uh, that, that just wasn't a thing that I did. Um, but you know, it would be natural to um, to try to do that. Maybe let's say that in a second. The other thing is, I, I did say that once you have a model like this diffusion tensor model, uh, you want to produce some summary measures. So. One thing is fractional anisotropy. It's just, you know, once you give people a summary me measure, they just go to their statistics department and just start cranking things out. And Dave Donahoe has a lot to answer for. That's all I have to say. So, okay, it's not Dave, I confess. Okay, so, um, so these are, but these are things. And, and this is really the, the, the point I think you were making in a way, is I'm, I put here in beware, in, uh, in bold, that the relationship between they're, they've been convenient to use, but do beware of the jump to biology from those summary numbers. Those summary numbers are not biology. In the ball and stick model, they're supposed to be summary numbers that correspond to biology. Whether they are or not, you know, we have to keep going. We have to do this. I, I would say that um, it was really an insight on Peter, I, and I, I think this diffusion tensor thing was great. It was really an insight that Peter and Carlo and so forth had to provide summary m measures. Uh, this crowd, the ball and stick crowd the firm that we were estimating with the uh, sparse fascicle models, have been slow to develop univariate numbers. And I, uh, I would draw your attention to some work by, I, I cited later by Del Aqua and colleagues, who are starting to build summary univariate numbers about the ball and stick model. I think once those happen, all of a sudden, instead of everybody reporting FA, they'll start reporting those univariate numbers. And um, I, I, think that'll, I think that'll happen. Uh, and I then wanted to go on to I, the thing I thought I was going to do was, and I will do now, is go to uh, across B values. So I, I showed you, here's you know, B value, the same voxels um, measured very close in time, very little motion, so forth. we think they're really the same voxels. Uh, and data one, data two, so these are replications of the data. And here are the models for B measured at B equal 1,000 and at a higher B value, B equal 2,000. And now that you're used to looking at it, I'm going to stick to B equal 4,000 at the bottom. So here's the kind of smooth uh, fits of the diffusion tensor model to, these two, to one of these data sets. And here's the sparse fascicle model. Everybody's happy over here. And here you can see they're starting to diverge. So this one has to be smooth, doesn't really have a choice, is doing as well as you can. This one starts to show a little bump. And if you go up to 4,000, um, you can see uh, that this one still has to be smooth. Uh, here are the data. Here are the data. Uh, this one plainly has a little bump now, <coughs> okay, plainly, over here. So there's a second two, two sticks in here. But the thing I also want you to notice is that uh, even though this model, which does really well at predicting from the first data set to the second one, does really quite well, uh, notice that many of the features of the data that when you look at it, and you know, I stared at this for hours, so you get to have 20 seconds. Uh, many of the features of these data, like look over here when you just repeat it, it's a little divot over here, and over here it's a big flat plane. They're not the same. So noise 
uh, reliability of the data, the ability to see the same thing twice, very important to consider. And when you look at data like this, if you start see, hearing people tell you stories about every single little divot on this thing, don't, don't go for it. We, if their data aren't that reliable. They're great data. They're beautiful data. We know a lot about them. It's pretty good. But there's a lot of stuff that's uncertain when you make a, a measurement. This is the, the, the feature under SFM at the right. These are the reliable, repeatable, very accurate representations of what we have learned from those measurements. Uh, all the uh, little ins and outs over here, even though these are very compelling 3D surfaces, they're noisy. And uh, so one has to, has to just be aware of that, just be aware of that. These fits are actually really good. I mean, you go back and you measure and you measure again, and you can reason from those. And the strength of your evidence is you've now learned something. It's actually quite amazing. I'm showing you, sure, there's limits over here, but it's actually quite phenomenal that you can take a living human brain, not hurt this person, put them in a magnet, go to a region about two millimeters big, and say, you know, right over there, it's got crossing fibers coming right through over there. That's fantastic, right? That's great. Uh, but, you know, you can't believe every single thing that comes out of your scanner, so just get, get comfortable with that. Please. Please. Um, you, let me agree with one thing. You can do better and better and better on signal to noise. And the better you do on signal to noise in various ways, uh, the, the more we're going to learn. And I do consider that as that's a day job. That, that's important. Okay. The, pers pers the exact way you suggested that I was going to take this person, I was going to take Eli and stick him in there and just keep him in there all day, can't do that. Okay, that's, there's a certain amount of time I can do it. And even if I could, his, some, Carla was saying this thing about, you know, your brain's pumping, and there's a, he gets tired and stuff like that. But the basic principle is, yeah, we ought to be doing better, and that's why we pay Carla the big bucks, get her, get her to do a little better. Okay. Uh, and then uh, she and I both picked um, Axe Caliber as yet another direction and way, way to use diffusion data. Neither of us is talking about it a lot, um, but I thought Carla's description was very nice. Uh, there's another parameter. I've been focusing on the B value from 1,000 to 2,000 to 4,000. And now uh, there's that other parameter of the diffusion time, which is very important. And Peter Basser uh, is involved in this. And Yaniv is really the lead on this, and, and he and his team. And, and uh, that's another interesting area to exploit. And uh, if uh, we manage to keep a few people studying the human brain and MR, then, uh, you know, that stuff might actually happen. It might actually happen. It's good. Okay. Next section. Tractography tools. Um, you know, I live in this world where uh, I really enjoy having lunch with MR physicists. And, one of the, and, and I also enjoy having lunch with um, uh, cognitive neuroscientists or clinicians and so forth. And the clinicians and cognitive neuroscientists all love tractography. Uh, it's just kind of cool for them. It's the visuals are good and so forth. Alex picked up a tractography image that he wanted to use for, for, for this. I mean, tractography is, you know, you, you pick up Time magazine and tractography. So. And then you talk to the MR physicists about it. Does Time magazine still exist? Okay, you pick up some magazine. But you, but you pick up, tra but, tra but you talk to the MR physicists like Basser, as an example. Sorry, Peter, if you're watching. You know, you go have lunch with Basser, and uh, this track talking about stuff. I don't know. These guys are just making this stuff up. I don't know how true it is. So I want to set that up as a, as, a, as a thing, that there's actually a, a, a deep mistrust about tractography. <laughs> and I think I understand why. Uh, I think the answer to that is that we need to keep working on it. Uh, but it actually does a lot of great stuff already, but maybe not so perfect uh, or not so thoroughly done as we've done on the, um, as in the single voxel case. So let me say a little bit about that. I'm going to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history, um, and then uh, I'll go to some of the ideas about this. And the, so um, I also stuck in a slide here that's got uh, track based spatial statistics, prob track, all the um, Oxford groups. Tools. They've been real leaders in developing these things. Susumu so Mori's team, MRI Studio, they call it these days, it used to be called DTI Studio, is useful. For, I, I, it's pretty much focused on diffusion tensor model 
and um, low B value analyses, and, and it's interesting and useful in clinical cases in many ways. Uh, Van Wadeen and his team um, have put together something uh, that's called TrackViz, and it uses multiple B value data and so forth in interesting ways. Anyway, have a look at these. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there, and, and I uh, describe these tools here in the header as tools for if you need to generate some tracks that are candidates that could be uh, connections between here and there or get some assessment of that, all of these are different ways to do it. Uh, the Mr. Tricks package from the Australian group, Tunye Connolly, and so forth. Uh, it's another thing, uh, Lehman's. Uh, anyway, a lot of good things. Uh, Danny Alexander has a nice set of open software tools called the Camino package that's out of UCL. And um, I hope there is, I, I hope you all get along. Just as long. There you go. There you go. So, uh, so there's a whole, a whole bunch of them. I may have missed some. And if, I, if, the, if your favorite one was missed there, and you want me to add more, send me. I'll fix the PDF before it goes up. I, I, you know, we write our own, and that, that's so. But we enjoy stealing from other people. Um, so the early ideas about tractography were just what Carla said. Uh, you kind of got a point here and a point there, and you kind of fit the diffusion tensor model. And if those two ellipsoids, well, you can see them over here. I've got this ellipsoid and this ellipsoid. These are all kind of lined up uh, together. Okay, wow, okay, that's going that way, and that's going that way, and that's going that way. Let's call it a, uh, let's call it a, let's call it a fascicle. We're in. Okay. And you might have some stopping rules. You might have some statistical analysis. There's a lot of stuff you might do. And the literature is filled with the signal processing folks arguing about, uh, about when do you stop, what's, how do you s properly subsample, I mean, all kinds of stuff. But you just do that a lot, and you end up pulling out examples of fascicles, and the idea is that at each point on the fascicle, there's a little diffusion ellipsoid uh, that's telling you that's kind of aligned with the basic local direction of the estimated fascicle like that. And I particularly want to mention the work uh, that got this started from uh, Susumu Mori's early paper and Tom Contouro's early paper uh, on this that, that used these and showed that it was possible to actually pull out bits of the optic radiation, optic nerve on different major tracks using this method. And I think that's still true. So if you're interested in knowing where in the white matters it most likely for the um, optic track to be, you can use these methods and, and get a good, uh, a good first estimate on this stuff. And, and uh, I, you know, people are still using it, and it's, it's OK. Um, it's not the best that's gonna, that we're going to get to, but it, it, it was a very good start. OK. Now, these were criticized almost from the first minute. That they were uh, that they were put out uh, because of two, uh, or let's call it three, uh, basic um, basic things. First off, uh, they're not uh, you know if you work in a double E department, almost every equation, every time when somebody shows you something about uh, a calculation, if they don't have a noise random variable in there as part of the calculation, you know you're not going to get your PhD in that department. It's just not going to happen. So these calculations don't expressly consider noise, noise issues. So they were criticized for that. Uncertainty was, was very poor. Second thing, uh, and I might have been one of the authors of uh, this criticism, these, these things go, are algorithms that are local and greedy. They find a track, and they write it down. They go back, and they find another track, and they write it down. And they never go back. I, I had a young kid at the time. You know, so they do one little thing at a time. He never sees the total mess that has been created by the one thing at a time. Never considers the whole the whole problem altogether. So they're local and they're greedy and doesn't consider. You know, well, now that you've generated for me and you know, 10 billion fiber estimates, uh, could that really plausibly be a description of the whole thing? He never looks at the big picture. So local and greedy was another problem. And the third one that you hear all the time is this question: Wow, have you really validated? And what people mostly mean by validation is have you made a measurement, let's say, over here on Carla, and then run down to the lab and taken some mouse and done some slice on some mouse and said it's the same thing. And, and, that's, and people say, well, have you done a histological evaluation? And you know I'm not going to take Eli's brain and slice that thing out. It's not going to happen. Unless, OK, OK, so, OK, so. Uh, we do need methods of validation, and we need better ways to think about validation, how we would do validation. 
So that's what that's what's coming. Okay. So to deal with the uncertainty, uh, Tim Behrens and his colleagues, there's some guy Smith on this paper, <laughs> wrote some, wrote some uh, really dealt with the uncertainty in a way, used the ball and sticks framework, uh, dealt with uncertainty, and wrote, a, I think it's, I'm guessing it's very widely used. We don't, I think it's very widely used, maybe the most widely used package for doing a kind of calculation uh, to estimate the likelihood the different places in the brain are connected, and also tell you about the likelihood that a particular voxel is on the way between these two. Between these two. And um, it, it's uh, written and described, and you can download it, and, and it's run extremely widely. Uh, the one thing that I, I criticize them for in the literature, although it's a great piece of work, um, is then the thing that stopped us from using it was there's this kind of notion of connection strength or probability of connection or something like this. And the way in which these probabilities are derived uh, are, is you kind of, if you've got two regions, A, and you want to know its connection strength to uh, region B, you look at all the stuff coming out of A, and then you find that fraction of it that went to B, and you take the ratio. And I have a long paper describing my view on that thing. I'm going to stop it here. But it's a very nice piece of work. Uh, I, I, what, we, what we thought about in, in um, what, we, what we decided to do in the face of that was we thought it was a good idea, and by we, I mean really Tony Sherbondi, Bob Doherty, a, a few others, this notion of generating tracts, candidate tracts, and then deciding which ones are you know, well supported by the data became kind of a central notion. That became important. And so uh, we thought that separating discovery and evaluation would be a good move uh, as opposed to having them uh, con uh, join. And, we, and because I'm a vision guy, I, I did a lot of that. Here's, here's the optic radiation. And from coming out of the thalamus, this little loop here is quite real, as Meyer's loop uh, comes out over here. And, and we started trying to separate track generation and evaluation with the data. And, and at this point in time, people are now pretty good at finding tracks like this. I should also say, the, this makes you realize that the thing that you're wondering, if I were to scan Arno over here, and you can see me, right? So I therefore believe that with probability one, Arno has an optic radiation. I don't need to know the probability that he has an optic radiation. The thing I'm actually interested in is when I scan him and I look for his optic radiation, how much strength do the data have in supporting the fact that he has an optic radiation? So I need to know how, you know, how closely those are linked. My data could be bad. My data could be good. I already know he has, he's got an optic radiation. So separating those ideas out is something that we spent a lot of time on. And uh, and it, it, it turned out to be helpful. OK, another set of tools. Wakana from Mori's group, you know, and I've got all these tracks, right? You run, you run the, some of these uh, prop track, or you run uh, Mr. Tricks, or you run any of these programs, and you go get yourself some massive number of findings. And now you'd like to be able to refer to them in some way that, that you could talk to clinicians or talk to other scientists about them and so forth. So track labeling, track identification, is an important one. And uh, this is a picture from us, but the ideas and so forth were really developed by Maury and Wakana and those guys, and we've been using them a lot. Uh, to basically say, when you get the whole package, there are different places you can put little planes, little cutting planes, little marks, little balls, and so forth, and uh, find the fibers that go through two, three, four of these planes and label them. And it feels just like a staining experiment in histology. You've got all these things, but the one that goes between here and here, label all those, give them a color. Those are the unseen. Those are the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Those are the ones that you label. And, and uh, this has now become, uh, again, a straightforward matter in the sense that you can go somewhere, download the code, run it yourself. And there are two packages that I know about. There may be others. Let me know. Um, one I know because Jason Yateman is down the hall from me, and he wrote this thing called uh, automated fiber quantification, which automates this process. And what he was particularly focused in was uh, on was getting the tract and then making measurements along the whole length of the tract, which is called tractometry by somebody. Uh, but making, you know, get the tract, and don't tell me just the average, actually show me the value all along the tract. And so uh, that's on GitHub. 
And uh, Tracula, it looks to be another package. I, I haven't used it, though. Jason told me he thinks it's nice to download it. It's also from the MGH group. And it's uh, another package for doing this. If you, I, I haven't noticed. If you, I, I didn't see one from Optimus. Yeah, that, that's used to Okay. So it, uh, Oxford is connected to this. Um, so, so summary of the section before we move on to the next. So there are high quality tools for track generation. I showed you a whole bunch of them. Uh, visualization seems to me, by the way, this is a little preachy, but that visualization of the tracks is actually an important part of working in this field. If you can't kind of see where they're going and when the, whether they're going in a plausible direction, whether they're coherent and so forth, you're really working blind. And you need to have, and computers are fine for doing this stuff. You need to be able to visualize this stuff. And montages and slices and so forth doesn't get it done. You really need to be able to see these things as 3D objects to feel comfortable in, uh, in your work on this, I think. And I also think that this tool set is evolving, expanding to include all kinds of new things, and, and um, that should be good. OK, so uh, let me now talk about a piece of work that Franco Pastilli led in my lab that um, is under review and not yet out. Uh, but I, I, I want to use it to give you a sense of where I think uh, stuff could happen and, and where I think should happen. So I just told you there's a whole bunch of these methods out there. You can, and now Arno downloads one, uh, Carla downloads one. Everybody's got one, and they, they download them. And, or even let's stick with one method, Mr. Trick's package. Very nice, really a beautiful package. Download that package and set a set of parameters. Mr. Trick's, they have a parameter L that has to do with the number of spherical harmonics that are used. And, and use a deterministic algorithm and tell me about all the fibers that are likely to be the cerebral spinal tract or the arcuate fasciculus, and here's the solution. That's great. And you go and you put it on the cover of nature. Say, so, okay, why not? Okay, well, if you run the same package with, um, uh, with L equal, I'm sorry, I should have had it down here. I don't know with L equal, A. oh, I did. L equal 8, and the probabilistic form of their algorithm, instead of L equal 2 and the deterministic, you get these tracks. And this is why Peter Basser yells at me. Okay? I, I try not to take it personally. But this is what, you know, this is the kind of thing, oh, those track topography guys. How can you have this and this? And, you know, you're supposed to, it's all supposed to be the same. Well, and we have, there have not yet evolved standards in the field for how it is uh, you run, you go get an estimate of the track, how do you know that it's I know it's right. Stephen Smith, he's a smart guy. What else do I need to know? Okay, so we need a, a way. We need a validation approach um, in which we look at the data that we have that we have collected. The data that we have collected. I can't emphasize that enough uh, for these subjects and this instrument. And you know, we need a way to look at the, uh, the this this method and and say, well, for these data, this hand, how much confidence do I have in that conclusion? And I'd like that measure to apply not just to the whole analysis, but how much how much support do I have in these data for this tract? Not like the whole thing, but for this tract, how much how much support do I have for that? And and I'm actually interested in the strength of the evidence. As I was saying, I, I know Arno has a optic radiation, I'm not worried about that. I'm wondering how effectively, how much confidence do I have for my data that I've estimated his optic radiation in exactly this way, this feature of it, and so forth. And, that should, and we need to be able to start comparing connect home solutions so that when I go back and look at these, I can tell you whether this is more likely reality inside the brain or this. I, I need ways to do that. We all need ways to do that. OK. so. How would you do that? Well, OK, um, Heger and I are completely correlated. If Heger had been working on this, this is what he would have done. Here are your data. Uh, here's an estimate. Now, this is the direction that everybody's been going. Take your data, go and make an estimate. Okay. Now, validation means you have your estimate, go back and predict your data. It's the inverse. That's what validation means. If somebody gives you a model of the data. Uh, you want to be able to take that model and say, ah, in that case, I should have had these particular diffusion measurements if that model were true. And I can then compare uh, what I measured with what the model predicts. And that would be a way to validate intrinsically. 
I don't have to go down to the lab and start slicing up mice or anything like that. I can do this on the subjects from the data that I have right, right in place. Okay? And that's very important to me because I, as a, somebody who measures a lot of kids and they bump around and stuff like that and measure stuff that I don't know, I can't really say I believe this measurement of the development of the track uh, in this, of the arcuate and this child is learning to read. And the reason I believe this measurement is because somebody some time ago once took a monkey and did some histology on the monkey's brain and, and said that these algorithms were kind of OK in that case. I can't, I can't live my life that way. So I have, to, I have to be able to check my own data and see that it intrinsically makes sense. Okay. So the, art, the, defu the um, model that you would use, since you know, it's the same model that you use to estimate the local diffusion of the tracks, and it does very well, say, well, in each voxel, the fascicles are the sticks. So what does that mean? That means that when you, when you build your model, you have a fascicle, you've got a voxel, and you've got a fiber going through that. You say, well, gee, that fiber, that fiber should be generating a diffusion signal like that stick. That's what it should be contributing. If I have a second fiber over here, it'll contribute uh, its own signal. And I say, well, how many fibers went through that voxel? 20, 30, how, how many you got? Each one should be a stick like this. They should all contribute. And then there's some general uh, isotropic diffusion. And that's, I'm going to take my fascicles from my estimate and produce this piece over here. And that's what Franco did in, in this analysis again. Uh, so what does that look like? It looks like a big linear equation. Say so each, we've got uh, each column says, well, is a fascicle. So that fascicle runs through, let's say, this first voxel, runs through it. And each entry over here is a different direction. So that fascicle runs through there. And I can say that fascicle for each one of these directions is making a particular contribution to that voxel. That's how much it is. And then it goes to the next voxel, and it might not run through there. So all the entries here will be 0. And then the next voxel might be there, and so it makes some prediction. So each column is the contributions of that fascicle to all the voxels that it passes through. And uh, we have to allow for the fact that when a fascicle passes through a voxel, it might go through dead center, it might go through just the edge, and so forth. So things have to have slightly different weights. And, and we you know, you can allow for that, too. Uh, these are kind of big problems. They were kind of scary to me when we started on this a couple of years ago. Uh, but you know, with the national debt being as large as it is, I'm no longer scared of these big numbers. <laughs> Uh, so, but you know, you get a hundred, say, uh, diffusion directions and a hundred thousand voxels, and and the, that's that's a big number, and that's the number of rows over here, about ten million, and then the number of columns. Well, you could get on the order of a million uh, fascicles estimated easily out of these track generation things. So you're looking at, you know, pretty chunky uh, linear systems of equations. But boy, uh, the signal processing guys and Donahoe and Hasty and Boyd, and so, they, these guys are really good at uh, handling these, these large things now. And uh, we're now running this kind of stuff on laptops. I, mean, I, I, I find the quality of the work that they've done in these uh, analyses and the equations just really um, cool. OK. So how would you see how well you're doing with these, with these things? Well, you go and oh, I should, I should have said it, by the way. I probably haven't emphasized this enough. When you, when you have a whole bunch of columns, let's say a million, and you go and you try to fit your data, and you find the weights for each of these fascicles, the first thing you're going to find, and this is the hugest effect, probably the thing I should have led, led with in a way. The first thing you're going to find is the weights of most of the fascicles, most of the time, are close to zero. So all those things that got generated, you didn't need most of them. They got generated, and they're there. And we typically start out with uh, you know, fascicles that'll, that'll to fill the uh, hemisphere on it on the order of 500,000. And uh, we'll solve this system of linear equations, say, well, how many did you actually need to describe all these data? And it'll be about 10% or 8% of the, of the total amount. So most of those candidates that were generated turn out there's no support for them. And we just throw those out right away. We call that culling. And we take the set of fascicles that are generated. Uh, we fit this linear equation. We end up <coughs> getting rid of them, uh, mo most of them, in that culling process. And we now have what we call the optimized connectome, which is to say the, co the collection of fascicles that uh, fit the data uh, as best as, as, as needed, um, when, and we get the weights and so, so forth. So that's a very important um, thing for us. OK, so what do you do? 
You take the data, we're going cross-validation here, everybody. Take the data, you go find yourself a connectome. You take the connectome, you go predict the data. You, um, you predict the data, you go get a second set of data. Here's a prediction, here's a second set of data, and you compare them. And you see how well you did. And uh, I, you do pretty well. So um, what is this? Uh, ah, oh, okay. Well, actually, you do pretty well, and I won't tell you that. But what this one here says is, well, so now we're in a prediction, we're in the possibility of doing that, let's say, for the two different algorithms that I started with, the one that was deterministic, L equal 2, and the one that was probabilistic. Uh, you remember, right? Jerry, you remember? There are two of them. There are two of them, right? And I'm, thank you. I'm going to compare. Uh, I'm not, thank you. Why is that this little code? That is, aren't there many connectors that might be producing data? Yes. So how does that solve the problem of finding the right connection? <laughs> So the, the, uh, the question, here, I'm going to restate your question. Um, this is one, there's a, a set of candidate fibers that are generated by the other group. I'm not in that group. Right? These are people who generate candidate fibers. And they come to you and they say, you know, I think this is the one. Somebody else comes to you. No, 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 don't listen to that guy. I think this is the one. You got to shop. You got to choose. So I'm not telling you that it's the right one or the wrong one, but I'm going to help you say that this one fits the data as well or as poorly as that one. Yes. Yes. And I'm now going to compare those two. That's exactly right. Okay, and I needed you to do that because I realized I had lost the crowd. No, really, that was good. Yeah, you're you're doing you're doing better than I am at following it, right? And that's what this one is. I had shown you two: one called deterministic, and one called probabilistic. Just what just what you know. You you saved the day here. And this axis here shows the error score at each voxel for the probabilistic algorithm, and this is the error score at each voxel for the deterministic one. And the fact that there's all this stuff up here says that if you had to choose just between those two, and this is kind of a coarse measurement, if you had to choose just between those two, choose this one. Because it's doing a much better job of explaining the data. Now somebody else will come to you with yet another one who may not do as good a job. But that's the tool I wanted you to have. It's not so much that I was going to tell you exactly which is the right one. I'm not that bad. I'm pretty arrogant, but not that arrogant. But I, I, I really needed a tool to go and assess. I had these people coming at me with these different proposals, and I needed a way to measure it. And that's what, that's what this is about. And I think having that measurement tool is a sta it's standard engineering practice, right? If you have a way to measure, you kind of evolve your way to better and better solutions over time, know what you can believe and not believe. So we're excited about this. That's why I spent some time here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, all of those things. One thing we do almost immediately on every piece of work is give it is post it. So uh, people will use it in lots of. I'm hoping people use it at all, uh, but hopefully in these different ways. We are using. I'll, I will give you some examples in a moment. So if you don't mind, I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end with a couple of ways in which we're using it. And I only have. I have no more. Minutes. OK, so validations are a good thing. Uh, and and uh, so let me say, this is almost an exact answer to you. To you. I I'm, I'm, have no more time, so, so I'm really going to. Actually, gonna... you do, Brian. That's been reading zero since you started. Oh, OK. In that case, <laughs> first. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> very precise, not very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, because this says zero. This says I have 15 minutes. Um, so uh, the question was, the question on the table is, how are you going to use this? Thing? And I'm going to give you two examples right now. So the first is, uh, I'm a vision guy. I've been working on vision for a long time. And um, 
uh, one of the things that we noticed, and by we in this case, I really mean Jason Yates, uh, who uh, discovered this particular tract that's really not in the literature, even though uh, very little in the literature. We should say that. You know, Bernicke saw it, Dejarine, and Bernicke argued about it, then disappeared. A guy named Greenblatt mentioned it in the paper in the 70s, and then uh, that's it. So it's called the vertical occipital fasciculus. But he's looking at these brains, and he's looking at stuff. And um, so here's the arcuate, just to position it. Here's the vertical occipital fasciculus over here. Uh, OR means optic radiation. So uh, he said, my God, that's right in the middle of visual cortex. Uh, what is that stuff? It's in the occipital lobe. What is that stuff doing? Okay, so, and we can see this. Uh, our group is a kind of one person at a time. People. We always study individuals. We, we almost never average between individuals. But that's a, that's a choice. So John Winnower is here, and John uh, led our many projects in, in our team for a, for a while. And this is from a paper John wrote in which the, um, he, we're, we're looking at the visual field maps and, and, uh, over here. And one of the things we're interested in is, well, you've got these maps, and then you've got these uh, fasciculi carrying information between the maps. Uh, what can we learn about this? Well, you know, there's actually theories about the relationship between these maps. I won't take you through this picture, but this is kind of a famous one. Dave uh, Van Essen got it started. This is a Fellman and Van Essen hierarchy of uh, how the visual field maps relate to one another. And Tony Movshin and Wallish uh, rescaled the sizes of the vi visual field maps and the thickness of these things to reflect uh, basically the size of and what's known about the relative strength of the connections and so forth. And, um, and, and so we were wondering, well, you've got this giant fasciculus that nobody had ever discussed sitting in the middle of visual cortex in the human. And you've got these theories about dorsal stream and ventral, st ventral stream and dorsal stream running around in these visual field map hierarchies. Surely these connections ought to, we ought to be able to understand in the human brain where they are with respect to these, kind, to these kinds of things. Uh, and, and so that's an example of how we put these together. And this is the work of Hiramasa Takamura. And Hiramasa went and looked at the visual field maps in individual human brains and looked at the endpoints of this vertical occipital fasciculus. And that's what's colored here. The relative coloring shows how dense the uh, endpoints were. And those things are just falling right there in the V3AB. There's a couple of maps that we identified some years ago. And uh, there are homologs. And, uh, and macaque and V3 over here. There's one set of endpoints is there, and then you look down at the bottom of the brain, and the other set of endpoints are down here. And the fourth, the human, in the human, it's unlike the macaque in several ways. One of which is that the fourth map is confined to the ventral surface, like St. John's were, and then uh, in a couple of other places like that. And so what we're concluding is that in the human, when you look at these things that are going dorsal. Uh, up here, and this is Hiramasa's work that's just about to press submit on, is that when you look at the dorsal stream and you look at the ventral stream of these maps over here, um, the biggest connection appears to be, surprisingly to us, uh, between B3AB and uh, the fourth visual field map and so forth. And, and I you know, would like to therefore go to the Fellman Van Essen diagram and sort of figure out where that should fit in and what the size of that is and so forth. And amended, and because they offered it as a as a working hypothesis, and we'd like to work with it. It seems like a good idea, and this is one way in which this is an answer to one way in which we use it. We used our algorithm. We 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 use Mr. Tricks and a couple of other methods to generate lots of candidate tracts. We then uh, spec use the Wakana idea, say, well, the ones that are going vertical, uh, dorsal ventral, uh, there's a couple of regions of interest that it would have to pass through. So find me those. Cull it all down so that it explains the data. Don't leave me any tracks that are not absolutely necessary for explaining the data. Get me only those. So we've got, we've got a set of tracks that, boy, if you get rid of those, your, your prediction of the data is just screwed up. And then I start telling you about how those tracks relate to the visual field map. No, th this is our description. A, a thing I'm, I'm not taking you in. So Jerry asked, did they predict this? 
And they didn't, I would say that predict, they, they didn't predict anything. No, these, they, they um, in macaque, V3 is this tiny little sliver of an area that's uh, something like 10% the size of uh, V2. In human, V3 is about uh, 75, it's much bigger, relatively, it's about 75%. So mostly, and I, and I have this picture up here to remind me to say this, mostly when you get the macaque electrophysiologist talking about these streams and so forth, they show you pictures like this, V1, V2, V4. They don't even mention V3. And the winnower is always needling us by sending messages saying, what about V3? And he and I put in some paper somewhere, we stand here in defense of V3. Uh, but the, the macaque guys, it's very, very slim and, and barely even there. In human, it's much bigger. So they didn't really have a prediction. Their, their work was based on macaque individuals within that hierarchy. And did I say it was great work, by the way? I, I, even though you know, we're building on it, we disagree with little bits and so forth, I'm spending my waking hours working on, on an agenda that they set forth. So even though I'm disagreeing, I love these guys. It's great stuff. OK. Um, the other whole other direction, again, same fasciculus, same thing. And this is my last, my last move for today. Uh, the, same, the same thing is I'm going to come back to this neuroscience for society. Because one of the big deals about being able to do this in the human brain, one of the really big deals, is that you can connect it to things that you care about uh, for um, reading, for disease conditions, and so forth. And if we don't take advantage of that, if we're always looking at, oh, well, we could do this so much better in the mouse. I mean, my god, the control we get, the replicability, I mean, everything is so much better in the mouse. You're not taking advantage of the, the fantastic gift that we have to be able to work in the living human brain and study the behavior and understand what it is that, uh, what implication these effects might have for human behaviors that we care about. And I've spent about a decade looking at reading in various ways, and this is an example of that. And th this is a different track, not the vertical occipital fasciculus, but th this is actually the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and the arcuate. And Jason was a lead on a project in which we looked at data in those two tracts in children who were learning to read. And you could look at the diffusion signals in those tracts and use these same basic ideas of tract segmentation, find them, optimize them, so forth, and uh, look at the diffusion signal and use the properties in those tracts to, in fact, in this case, it's correlate with the reading skill of these kids. So I would say it's a funny way to use correlate because we had these kids back for four years in a row. And we took the diffusion data from the first year to predict uh, their reading skill across all four years. And uh, the quality of prediction isn't perfect, but you know, I mean, just imagine what you're doing here. You're taking a kid, sticking them in a scanner, seeing how the little water molecules move around. You write that down. Then you take the kid and you put them in a room and you have them read words and see how quickly they can read words. My God, those two things end up having an association with one another uh, of uh, explaining 43% of the variance. So that's kind, of, that's kind of interesting. And we're in the process now of making the measurements early and letting the, making the prediction uh, down the road. And this whole field, which I think John Gabrielli and, uh, or Fumiko, somebody, uh, has relay, used to be called biomarkers, but it's a much better term to call it neuroprognosis. Um, is, is something that is, is actually kind of interesting uh, because you could help people with it. So if you take it, and, and so we're working with this company, Linda Mubel. Jason is really the lead on this. He went out and found them, talked them into it, and they bring me along so you see. And even this professor will agree with this. Um, he's working with these kids at Linda Mubel, uh, measuring them before they go in. And then Linda Mubel does these very extensive therapies, very extensive treatments. And some of them it's going to work for. And some of them it's not going to work for. And the idea is that we might be able to look up front to see from the measurements, ah, this is a kid that has a profile in their brain for which uh, this therapy will work. And this is a kid that has a profile for which this therapy, if it's this profile, that therapy never works. That's, that's the goal. It's the picture. So all these things about the fusion and the scanners and the tensors and all this kind of stuff, for us, the purpose is to get mixed in and do something good. Uh, and I got started in the field really because I, you know, I met parents. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't my kid, but uh, but I really felt for him, 
who's, you know, kid was told that he wasn't a good reader and he's, uh, he was lazy, he was stupid, you know, stuff like that. And, and, and you know, it just seems so unfair. And then they go, put him in special. Oh, by the way, the other, other people say, say, well, you're going to scan every kid. How expensive is that? Well, you know, when kids don't read, they put them in special ed. And it costs many, many tens of thousands of dollars. And the cost of doing a diffusion scan is like 200 bucks. So you kind of, anyway, so I'd like some economists to help me out on this particular one. Uh, and, and so in any event, why are we doing this? I just wanted to end back. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? These are the answers to your questions. And thank you. I, I really would like you to look at the pictures of these guys. Ariel uh, did all the work on the uh, sparse FASCO model implementations and diffusion tensor uh, comparisons and modeling and so forth. Franco has done many things, including the whole life thing, which I hope goes well for him. And uh, Hiramasa and Jason have, have worked on the, using the tracks and interpreting data and applications of this and use all those tools that Franco, Ariel have been uh, implementing in a very nice way. And so they're a very nice team. It's been a pleasure working for them. You should uh, look for them when you're doing your next hiring rounds. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you for the uh, invitation. It's great to be here. So I'm going to talk about uh, diffusion MRI in the HCP, the Human Connectome Project. Uh, the HCP, as um, many of you will know, um, has been quite high profile in the last couple of years, was an NIH-specific call um, for consortia to put together um, bids to generate the richest possible in vivo human macro connectome mapping over a five-year period. So this is $30 million. Um, and so the, the consortium, the, the primary consortium here is uh, between WashU, UMIN, and Oxford. And we're trying to generate human in vivo macro connectomic mapping using primarily diffusion MRI um, along the lines of everything you've seen today. So that's the structural connectivities uh, and resting state function MRI getting us the functional connectivity mappings, kind of thing that people like Steve Hansner probably a lot more familiar with than um, the structural connectivities. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing this in large number of subjects, 1,200 subjects at least, um, and also acquiring task fMRI, MEG, behavioral measures, and genetics. And these last things um, should be really, really exciting as we get the large data set complete, because we should have enough subjects to do really interesting correlations between the functional and structural connectomes and behavior uh, environment, genetics, and, and the whole thing has to be given out. We're already giving out um, the data, um, the software that's being developed, um, the, the pipelines for doing this kind of connectomic mapping. <coughs> uh, there's a couple of um, primary papers. There's been a lot of papers already out on this, but I'll point you at two in particular uh, of relevance to the diffusion in the Human Connectome Project. One is from uh, Camille Ugabil covering a lot of the um, acquisition, the hardware and pulse sequence uh, stuff of the project. That's just come out in a special issue on connectomics in your image. And uh, Stam Sotaropoulos from Oxford um, has focused even, even more focused on the diffusion, so the, um, the data and <coughs> the processing that we've been applying to the diffusion. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of what makes the um, acquisitions and the data um, quite special. And we've very much been trying to push the sort of bleeding edge of diffusion to get the very best data. But because we're going to do it in large numbers of subjects, uh, we wanted to make it something that was um, still quite robust, so not so bleeding edge that um, we'd be getting lots of, say, motion artifacts, lots of problems with, with the data sets. And what, so one of the biggest things in the, the hardware that makes this really cool is very strong diffusion gradient. So this is what Carla was explaining um, in a lot of her slides, um, is the diffusion encoding gradients, the, the uh, additional magnetic fields that you add on top of the fixed V0 field. And if you have really strong gradients, and we've got strong gradient coils and a strong gradient amplifier to feed it, then you can get um, really strong gradients in the data, which uh, in in the in the brain, so that you can get really high B values very quickly, which means without a hideous loss in SNR. We've seen, I think, in both talks now, examples where as the B goes up, 
you get a richer measure of the diffusion processes um, in the voxel, but you lose in the SNR. One of the um, exciting things for everyone coming out um, partially um, from the developments in the HCP is a new scanner from Siemens, the Prisma, is now available, um, which actually has, in many ways, improved uh, electronics and nearly a strong gradient. So right now, people can start to get hold of this kind of kit. <clears throat> the acquisitions are um, really at the leading edge of the kind of typical things that Carla was saying. So we're pushing to 90 directions, but we're getting 90 different angular directions um, at a range of B values. So in every data set, we're getting three shells of B values. The, the lower B values give us extra SNR. The high B values give us richer information about the track structures within a voxel. Um, and of course, having lots of directions gives us um, higher angular precision for looking at these tracks. And we're pushing the resolution very high too, trying to get down to close to a millimeter. And so we're acquiring 1.25 isotropic millimeter voxels. We are using monopolar special tanner diffusion encoding, which is, is one particular choice. It's not the most common choice um, because it actually has worse eddy currents than um, typical schemes for acquiring diffusion data. Um, but you get quite a gain in SNR. And the reason we're happy to um, have worse eddy currents in the HTP is because we've developed a new post-processing um, method that is um, really sophisticated for um, removing even these uh, worse eddy currents. So we can fix that in the analysis later. <coughs> and we're using the multiband acceleration that I've got a slide on uh, in a minute, which enables us to get the diffusion data and also the resting state uh, much faster than uh, before. Here in the diffusion, it's an acceleration factor of three. So that means we can get all of these 600 volumetric images in just one hour. And I'll talk a bit about some of the new processing tools that we've had to develop to take advantage of the data and to fix some of the new problems that are associated with really pushing the acquisition. Um, you probably also will have heard of um, another HCP. Um, it's a, a different consortium um, led from MGH. And in the MGH HCP, they're really concentrating on even more bleeding edge um, hardware. So they're really pushing the uh, gradients up to 300 millitesla and pushing the B values um, associated with that ability up to 10,000. <clears> As you can see, that's um, giving much lower signal, but there should be rich, interesting structure there. So this is really pushing the limits of uh, MRI hardware. And it's too early to tell um, how well this will work, whether it will be able to pull out usable and robust data. But everyone is very much hoping that they are able to take advantage of this uh, amazing hardware to get a really good diffusion. Um, just talk briefly about the multiband acceleration. Um, I think Arno said you're just about to run it here. You said DSI, but I presume you didn't mean DSI. Yeah, so Hardy, not, not DSI. OK. <clears throat> we'll talk later. <laughs> you, you can't correct the edits in DSI. Um, so in multiband, um, several labs have been developing this in the last few years, one, one of which is UMIN. And the idea is that you can simultaneously acquire multiple slices. In the case of diffusion data, it's three slices. Um, and when you actually get them back from the scanner, these are all mixed up together. It's hideous. They're all mixed up, and so you need to unmix them. And this is done, as Carla briefly explained, by utilizing the fact that the different coils in this multiple receive um, <coughs> RF head coil um, see different parts of the brain with different intensities. So it's very much like in-plane acceleration, like graphy. You're using the different coil profiles to separate out the different signals from the different slices. In the fMRI, we can push this up to an acceleration of times eight um, very effectively and still separate out the, the uh, different slices from each other. <clears throat> you can see an example here of the huge improvement in SNR that you get from having the stronger gradients. So this is the B equals zero images. This is with no diffusion weighting. Um, and then um, you can see from a typical data set, we actually still have worse SNR and, and diffusion contrast in a 1,000 
than we're getting in the HCP gradients at 3,000. So you can see the, the, the general SNR, like here, is, is better. But also these strong stripes, this is the, the same kind of diffusion contrast that tells us about the track directionality that we've seen um, in talks from Carla and Brian. <coughs> we've had to do, um, basically rewrite most of the processing that happens to diffusion data. So one thing is that when you get um, the data from multiple coils, um, a standard uh, sum of squares combination of the data from the multiple coils leads to a raising of the noise floor. And that's what you can see in the red curve here. Um, but by applying a sense-like reconstruction to combine the data from the coils whilst it's still complex, um, <coughs> we can get down, back down to the noise floor. So an improved method for combining across the different coils data gives us increased, um, contra uh, increased contrast, so increased dynamic range across the, the range of different diffusion directions. Um, another low-level technical detail that has been really important for um, the HCP data is to correct for nonlinearities in the gradient. Something I, I think Carla didn't mention is that we often have not perfectly linear gradients, but particularly when you're really pushing the hardware, you can have nonlinearity so that you don't actually have the expected um, magnetic field and the gradient in the magnetic field that you wanted. And this causes not just geometric distortions, but also causes us not to get the B values and the B vectors, the, the, magnet, the diffusion encoding that we thought we get. So that all has to be corrected carefully. <coughs> and that seems like that's working well. Then we get hideous distortions from the use of uh, echoplanar imaging. And obviously, this, this can get worse in various ways as you try and get, say, higher resolution data. You can see here the, these two images are distorted in opposite directions. <coughs> so we're, we're acquiring the phase encoding direction in a slightly unusual left, right, and right, left, rather than anterior, posterior. And that's primarily because the smaller field of view means we actually end up with smaller total distortions. And, but what's quite exciting here is a new method from Jesper Anderson for correcting these. Rather than acquiring a traditional field map, which tells us about the, um, the B0 effects, uh, we can take this left, right, right, left matched pair and use, um, on, on the basis of Jesper's nonlinear registration program, FNERT, he can just walk them symmetrically towards each other until they perfectly match in the middle. And once you've got that uh, one-dimensional warp field, you can derive from that what the field map would have been um, in case you need that for any other processing. And because you're not taking a relatively slow field map to, to achieve this correction, um, this can uh, work quite a lot better, and we get very low distortion results. Yeah, so you, so you need to take the left, right, right, left uh, matched. Um, you only strictly have to do that for the B equals naught images because those are the images which are driving this. Um, but actually, I think we take everything both ways anyway and get two copies of each of the 90 directions. <coughs> so then we come on to something that's um, just as nasty and just as hard to deal with, which is the eddy currents that um, Carla was talking about. Uh, so each of these different images uh, is a different gradient uh, direction, so different um, diffusion encoding direction. So you can see different tracks lighting up differently in these different directions. That's the point of the diffusion data. But what comes along with that is every time we apply the gradients in different directions, we get different eddy currents, which is why the brain is jumping around so hideously. And one of the nasty problems here is that unlike normal registration um, issues, where the normal scenarios for applying registration these images fundamentally don't look like each other, so you can't just apply a trivial affine transform. Um, in, in the early versions, well, up until now, really, the early versions of FSL preprocessing, um, I originally wrote a five-line script to apply affine registration to do this, but it really is not working well once you get data um, like this, really leading-edge data. So we needed something better to improve um, the alignment across these different images. Otherwise, when you do the tractography or your tensor fit, you get hideously blurred data. And there'd be no point at all in having acquired high res data in the first place. <coughs> so again, Jesper has come up with uh, an incredibly sophisticated approach for fixing this. 
and it works really well. So he takes the raw data, he feeds it through um, all of the corrections necessary. So the field map based corrections that I was talking about previously, which have already been run with the left, right, right, left pairs. Um, applies an estimate of the head motion correction and the eddy current correction. We don't have that estimate yet, so this is going to be iterative to increasingly improve our estimates of those corrections. And we get um, what we hope is a corrected version of the data. But that's still noisy. So now we have this magic thing called Zoltar. <coughs> and Zoltar is a predictor. It's actually, mathematically, it's a Gaussian process which in effect is regularizing over all of the different diffusion encoding directions. So it provides um, a hugely cleaned up version of the data, but one which does so whilst taking advantage of what it knows about how the different directions relate to each other. So similar directions should give similar data, and it's very much taking advantage of that. <coughs> so you then feed that cleaned up predicted data from Zoltar back through the distortion so that you end up with a re-distorted version of the cleaned up data. Um, and now you can compare that with the original data and directly derive from that an update to what it thinks the uh, eddy current correction should be. And you iterate many times on that. <coughs> and um, so what's really neat here is that at no stage are you trying to align different directional data that are just different from each other because Zoltar knows how they should be different, and so can take that into account when it predicts the cleaned up data. Another nice thing here is that um, because we're working at this point in the raw data space, uh, we can automatically detect um, outlier slices, so bad slices in the raw data, and re-impute those from the non-bad slices. <coughs> and you can see here just how well that works on the ConnectM data. There's basically no visible motion. Um, I asked Jesper for a version of the slide where instead of the before, we'd applied the default processing from my five-line script. And he wouldn't send it to me because it actually makes it worse, not better. So. <coughs> and even more amazingly, here is the vehicle's 10,000 data. Um, MGH sent some to, to Jesper because they were about to throw it away. Um, and you can see that um, the, the SNR is very poor here. You can also see what's really cool in this data is that the, 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 the um, orientational sensitive contrast here that's actually picking up the tracks in different directions is very strong. These images don't look remotely like each other, and that's because they're all showing very different orientational structures in the data. So there's no way that like a flirt affine registration would be able to align these. Um, but Zoltar um, is doing very nicely, uh, as you can see on the right. Um, so, back to our data, this is an example of a single subject's pre-processed data. If you compare that with some of the raw native space data that Carlo is showing from more typical acquisitions, uh, there's re really a lot of lovely detail in that. And as you go down to the 3000, um, you can see, obviously, the SNR is dropping, um, but you're getting a lot of nice contrast, meaning you're seeing different directions you know, showing up differently. <coughs> so, as I said, uh, for every subject, they're in the scanner for an hour, and we get 90 directions times two for each of these um, shells of different B values. Um, here's another nice qualitative result showing uh, just the gorgeous detail in the fractional anisotropy if you just fit a tensor model. Um, so this is typical two millimeter, three tesla data. This is the connectin data, and this is the principal diffusion direction, color coded in the same way that Brian was showing. So really nice spatial detail there. <coughs> um, with respect to tractography, I won't show you a lot on the tractography. Um, we've mostly been concentrating on bottom-up um, processing, so improving all of the lower-level modeling, um, like I've been showing you, correcting for the distortions. We've done some tractography um, on this, and you can see in the general area of um, the very strong corticospinal tract with the 1.25 mil data, we're able to separate out um, tracks which are really difficult to separate out each other, from each other in the, the worst resolution data. <coughs> this is the final example from that. The HCP data is, um, is a new way of visualization from uh, Calamante, which is 
called track density and Im imaging, and it's basically kind of like a super resolution FA. Um, you just um, because with probabilistic tractography, you're able to um, follow the probabilistic track path through at effectively sub-voxel resolution. I won't go into the details how you're able to do that, but you're taking advantage of the fact that you have very rich information from so many diffusion directions. <clears throat> you can seed in the throughout all of the white matter, just take thousands of random seeds, just follow the tracks that you get from these seeds, and just add them all up. It's a very simple idea, but it's very nice for showing the quality of this kind of data. So that's actually from um, the group of Donald Tonier, so it's proof that we do get on well. Um, and so Saad was running that just yesterday uh, to generate this lovely movie for you, and this is the first time we've run the, the TDI. So this is basically regenerating the tractography at 0.2 millimeter from the 1.25 raw data. You can see really gorgeous effects of very fine detailed tracks moving through the brain. <coughs> and this is the same thing and color coded again in the same way. Um, and what's nice is not just the apparent high resolution, which I, I think it actually is meaningful here, but just the, the gorgeous continuity of the curves. This really isn't so obviously voxelated. <clears throat> um, slightly more quantitative um, way of judging the value of the resolution. Here's some um, post-mortem data, very high resolution from MGH and also separately um, post-mortem human data from Carla uh, taken in Oxford. And you can see the uh, cortical anisotropy in the gray matter. <clears throat> so you can see um, clear uh, anisotropy um, for reasons that we understand in the gray matter that is generally perpendicular to the gray-white boundary. Um, that's been very hard to see in vivo. So for example, two, typical two mil data here, um, you can barely see it. But in the HCB data, it's really quite clear. Um, <coughs> obviously, you don't necessarily immediately need that to do the white matter tractography, but I'm sure um, that it, it will be valuable to be able to see that. Um, so I finish with just a few slides on um, some of the more advanced um, developments in, in the processing methods that um, will both improve the, uh, the data that we're able to give up from the HCP as we um, will be disseminating both the low level data, but also anything that, that's higher level that we derive from that. For example, we'll be giving out the raw data, we'll be giving out um, the eddy current corrected data, we'll be giving out the um, estimates from a program called Bedpost X, which is quite similar to <coughs> um, what Brian was talking about, the multiple sticks um, on a, a sphere model, except that it's Bayesian, so you actually get um, estimates of uncertainty on these track directions. So all of that will be given out um, increasingly over the next three years. So some of these upcoming things are one of them is um, extending this model of the multiple sticks on a sphere um, to take advantage of the multiple shells. So the fact that we have multiple B values um, in each data set, so simultaneously fitting this Bayesian model to that. And this is a really nice example of <coughs> um, how you can improve um, the estimate of several distinct, in this case, I think it's three distinct um, pathways within each voxel. And the fact that these are coherent from voxel to voxel in data which um, hasn't been regularized spatially, so there's no natural enforcing of this coherence, um, speaks a lot to the validity of that. Um, underlying this image is an FA-like image. It's actually what the kind of thing that Brian was suggesting we needed more of, which was um, FA-like summaries derived from probabilistic uh, low-level models. And you can see if we only take into account one shell at a time. We just don't have that same coherence and ability to model multiple um, fibers uh, separate from each other. There's also an issue of distinguishing fanning. You can see the idea of fiber fanning going up into the crest of a gyrus here from crossing fibers. And that's been something that traditionally has just not been possible um, within a voxel to see the distinction because Obviously, you have a range of orientations of fibers within a, within a voxel. It could be fanning, it could be crossing. Um, and for the first time, it seems like uh, with new Bayesian models for this and with data like the HCP, you're actually able to distinguish that. And that could be really important when trying to understand the ways in which um, tracts go into gyri. There's 
this kind of bias in many analysis methods that you tend to end up in the crest rather than the sides. So this is something that hopefully this will help with investigating. There's also um, a new method called Rubik's for um, putting together data sets of different resolutions in the same subjects and taking um, using the complementarity between um, having high SNR in larger voxels, which means we can get higher B values and look more richly at the range of directionalities of the fibers within the voxel, so separating out distinct fiber populations from each other. But then if we take um, higher resolution data, we can't do that because we don't have the SNR in the small voxels. But what we can do instead in a very complementary way is look at the exact spatial location of the fibers that we can pull out. So again, with a Bayesian model that pulls these two pieces of information together, um, we're able to do a better job um, combining across multiple resolutions and a better job of finding the distinct fiber populations that are, for example, here clearly crossing each other but still coherent within a color. Um, so it turns out for the HTTP data, the, the data is so good that Rubik's um, we're not using because the data is already so good it doesn't actually need it. But we're about to start putting together data um, from three Tesla scanning in the HTTP <coughs> with seven Tesla data, which will be um, carried out for a subset of the HTTP subjects. And so we'll probably uh, aim to use Rubik's to combine across those field strengths um, in similar ways. <coughs> so we're a year or so into um, acquiring the data, having spent the first couple of years um, setting up all of the protocols, de developing the methods. And we've already released 40 subjects diffusion data um, and one or two hundred more will be released before the end of 2013. As I said, there's also, of course, resting state fMRI, but I don't have time to go into that today. But um, there's something that I personally have been working with a lot, actually more than the diffusion. We've already released 130 subjects data sets, each an hour long resting state um, of nearly 5,000 time points per subject. This is a, a huge data set, and we've been able to do more detailed network modeling of functional networks um, than I've been able to do on any other data set previously. <coughs> um, one big area of research, not just for people within the HTTP, but anyone out there working with the data, a, a really rich challenge for the immediate future is how to put together the functional and structural connectivity information. Um, this is one example where the connectivity from a single C point is very coherent between the function and structure. Most places it's not nearly that straightforward and, and equivalent. <coughs> so there's a huge amount to do to just bring together these complementary pieces of information that have, I mean, they have to be made to agree with each other in the end one way or another because it's the same thing. And part of that is a lot of people are interested in reducing the full connectivity into the, in the brain to a series of parcels and estimating the connectivity between these parcels. It's, very useful shorthand. Um, but of course, we can't start to do that in terms of comparing the functional and structural parcelated connectivities unless we're able to come up with a data-driven parcelation which is consistent across the two modalities. So this is something that a lot of people are, are looking hard at. And finally, this is a, another it, arguably even more challenging um, project which has just kicked off in the UK and this is to do connectivity mapping, um, functional and structural imaging and connectome modeling even before birth. So shortly before birth and shortly after birth um, we're going to attempt to get usable connectivity data in babies, um, 1500 babies including 2 to 400 um, at increased risk of autism and 200 born prematurely. So that should be fun. Thank you.